Welcome to module 14 of the CompTIA A plus course. So for those of you that's been following along, welcome back. For those of you that's brand spanking new, maybe subscribe, maybe go and check out module one first because this stuff does actually follow on one another. You can't just go and jump in the middle unless you're looking for something specific. Well, folks, what is on the agenda for today's module? That would be four main sections. So the first one we're going to be diving into today is configure Windows networking. The second is troubleshoot Windows networking. Yes, I know it sounds very much the same, but it's not. The third is configure Windows security settings. And then the last and the fourth one would be manage Windows shares. Well, there you have it, guys, the four main sections. Now, obviously, like usual, that's not going to be everything in the course. If you would like a more accurate list, that can be found in the video description down below. And next to each topic, you'll find a nice, convenient timestamp. Ain't I nice? Yes, I am, because it takes me freaking forever to go and put those in there for you guys. You wouldn't believe how long it takes to get those timestamps. Anyway, putting that aside, guys, considering how much effort I do, I mean, if you look at the timestamp, the least you can do is give this video a like. So don't be a weenie. It does help me out. It does help the channel. And if you would like to know when the other modules comes out, well, subscribe. All right, on to the first section, configure Windows networking. The first topic we're going to be looking at in this section is Windows networking connection types. Now, what do we mean by that? Or should I say, what does CompTIA mean by that? Well, guys, they mean the way you would go and connect your desktop, your laptop, your server to a network. I mean, like physically, or at least half the time it's physically. So the first one would be wired, a cable. In other words, Ethernet. So when we say wired, what do we mean? I'm going to go and I'm going to go and plug in a network cable of sorts into my laptop my desktop or my server, and assuming you've got all your network configurations correct, you would be able to go and communicate over the network. Now these cables are referred to as Ethernet cables, something you guys might have heard in the previous modules. If you've watched my other courses, you would definitely know that an Ethernet cable is not just a LAN cable. A lot of folks are under the impression that when someone says Ethernet or Ethernet cable, that it is limited to a LAN cable, the one that comes with an RJ45 connector. Folks, it is not limited to a LAN cable. An Ethernet cable, believe it or not, can in fact also be other types of cables, like a coaxial cable, and it can also be a fiber cable. Any form of native cable, like fiber, coaxial, or your normal LAN cables, whether we're talking Cat5, Cat6, Cat7, 8, or whatever, all of them fall into the category called Ethernet. Ethernet is most certainly not limited to LAN cables, folks. Now, another way you can go and connect your machine, this is not applicable to all machines. I think this is more applicable to like laptops, maybe phones and tablets. Yep, you probably know what I'm going to say. Wireless. So if you look at something like a laptop, laptops, well, at least most of them, have a wireless network card embedded in them as well. So they've got two network cards, one which accepts an RJ45 connector from your LAN cable, and we've got a second one, which is your wireless one. Majority of laptops can connect to two different types of networks. Now, when it comes to wireless, there's various kinds of frequencies and standards you can go and connect to. That is not the actual topic here right now. Just know that there is many. And if you'd like to go and connect to a network, it's not going to be a cable, guys you need to go and search for a wireless network. You or the user will be searching for what is known as an SSID. That, folks, is the wireless network's name. This can be anything. You can call it whatever you want. You can call this Banana Town if you really want to. It can be anything. So if I want to call this Burning Ice Tech and you go with your laptop and you come near enough to my network, you would essentially see a network that is listed as Burning Ice Tech. But if one of you guys want to go and do that, you can also go and call your network burning ice tech. And that's going to obviously cause a lot of confusion if you were to come close enough to, you know, to my network. You know, So we don't want two networks that's called the same to be too close to one another because that's just going to cause a heck of a lot of confusion. All right. And here, folks, we've got the topic of IP addressing schemes. So first up, internet protocol addressing. In other words, normal IP addresses. 
So when it comes to IP addresses, you get something called IP version 4 or IP version 4 addressing, and you get something called IP version 6 or IP version 6 addressing. Up until Windows XP, or if you look at the server equivalent, that will probably be server 2003, we had only IP version 4. So that was up until more or less the, the end of 2008. And in the beginning of 2009, maybe around the end of 2008, they went and released, when I say they, I mean Microsoft Windows, they went and released something called Vista, or Vista, however you want to go and pronounce that, I'm probably butchering the name. So they went and released that along with Server 2008. And when they did that, there's obviously a lot of new goodies and functions and features that came along with that, one of which is IP version 6. Now IP version 6, I'm not going to lie to you guys, is a heck of a lot more complicated than IP version 4, but unfortunately, we are slowly moving towards a direction where we are running out of IP addresses. Yep, and if we run out of IP addresses, that causes a lot of problems. For example, we will not be able to connect to the internet. The average person and the average device needs an IP to be able to connect to the internet. Now, to help address that issue, they went and released something called IP version 6, and this has got a heck of a lot more IP addresses available. If you look at like IP version 4, IP version 4 has a maximum of approximately 16 million IP addresses. How many people is there in the world? Well guys, the last time I checked it's approximately 8 billion people. They say the average person has about 2 to 3 devices, so that's about 16 to 24 billion devices. And um, please note, I didn't even include things like printers and scanners and firewalls and access points, etc, etc. So we are probably well over 30, 40 billion devices. How many IPs do we have again? Only about 16 million if you look at IP version 4. Now, how the heck are we going to get so many freaking devices onto the internet because they all need an IP address to be able to go onto the internet? Poses a bit of a problem. Now, there's many ways around that problem, but unfortunately, the only one we're going to mention here is the fact that you also get IP version 6 now. That's not the only solution to that problem, though, folks. Now, what else do we have here on our list? Default gateway. This is something some of you guys may or may not have seen. So if you've ever attempted to go and configure an IP address on the machine, you know, statically or manually, you would have seen it also asks you for a default gateway. You know, that along with subnetting, the subnet mask and the DNS. Now, what is the default gateway? Well, guys, that is the first device that your device or the user's device has to go through or hit before it gets to the outside world or is able to go onto the internet, or if it, if it wants to go onto another network for that matter. So if you're sitting at home on your personal laptop or desktop, and you would like to go to a website online, let's say this is Facebook or YouTube.com, what is the first device that your laptop or desktop has to go through to be able to get to the outside? That, folks, would usually be your router. Some folks pronounce this as the router, some pronounce it as router, depends on which country you're from, I suppose. But in essence, it is your router. Now, this is not always applicable to other environments. If you look at a home environment or a small office environment, yes, the first and only device will probably be the router. But if you look at a medium to a large size company, it might most likely not be the router which you're going to hit first. It'll probably be something like a firewall. The firewall, it's a physical firewall, by the way. It's not a digital one, not a piece of software. It's an actual piece of hardware. It looks like a switch at first glance if you were to see it physically. Now, the firewall is the first device that you or the user has to go through to get to the outside. And from there, it might go through other devices, and eventually, it's going to end up going through the router. So once again, getting back to the default gateway, if you are going to go and configure the default gateway on a device, this could even be your own computer, you need to type in the IP address of the first device you're going to hit. So if you're in a home or a small office environment, it's probably going to be the IP address of your router. If you're in a medium to a large size company, it's more than likely going to be the IP address of something like the physical firewall, folks. All right, and then we've got something called Domain Name System, better known as DNS for short. This is also known as Domain Name Service in some cases. What is that. This is something you'll be able to configure on the exact same menu as your default gateway, your IP address, and your subnet mask. The DNS, if I have to summarize the living heck out of it, converts IPs to names and names to IPs in a nutshell. 
Now guys, don't get me wrong, that's not the only thing it does. It does a heck of a lot more than that. But in a nutshell, converts IPs to names and names to IPs. So the next time you open a web browser and you type in an address like youtube.com or facebook.com, I want you guys to keep this in the back of your mind. Your computer doesn't actually know where that is or what that is. That is something that you or the user can see and that you or the user can understand that is very user friendly. In reality, what your computer sees is ones and zeros and all kinds of weird ciphertext. So when you type in Facebook or YouTube.com, your computer has no idea what that is. So what's going to happen here is your machine, and this all happens like in a fraction of a second, is going to contact the DNS. What's going to happen then, another step here, is the DNS is going to go and check for your machine what or where that place called YouTube or Facebook is. So it's going to ask your machine, okay, my bra, what did you say that site is called? Your machine is going to say, um, my user typed in youtube.com into me. And the DNS is like, okay, cool, I've got you, let me check. And you can kind of imagine it going through a whole bunch of physical files, looking, 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 and eventually it's going to go and pull something that is known as a record. It's going to pull the record for Facebook. Once it opens it, it's going to see what the IP address for Facebook or YouTube is, whatever site you're trying to go to. It's going to tell your computer or your device what that IP address is, and then your computer would know where to go to. And if you really want to, you could actually just go and type in the IP address of the, the website you want to go to. You can type that in the address bar, and that would actually work, believe it or not. Now, who knows all the IP addresses for all the websites they want to go to? Definitely not me, folks. So to make things easier for us to remember and to understand, we tend to use something user-friendly, like a name like Facebook or YouTube. When you use those names, that's very easy piece to remember, and it's very easy piece to understand what's going on there. But if you wanted to, you can go and maybe take a physical book or a notepad file or something, and you could, if you really wanted to, you can go and type in the IP addresses for all the websites that you want to go to. And you don't really need the DNS in those cases. But normally your machine is going to go and ask the DNS, where is this website? And the DNS will tell your machine where that website is. Something a lot of people don't realize though, is your machine only asks the DNS the very first time it goes to that specific website. Then it would remember how to get to that website. Your machine stores that information in something called the DNS cache on your computer. You can think of this as temporary memory. It's very much the same as me inviting you guys to my office or my house. So the very first time you come to my office or my house, I'm going to have to give you the address, or you're going to have to go and Google it or something. And um, the first time, once you've gotten the address, you're probably going to have to go and punch it into a GPS of sorts, more than likely the one on your phone. So the very first day, you're going to come to my house for the first day of A plus training. Maybe you're going to come to my house so I can train you on A plus. So the first day, you will use your GPS because you've got no idea where I stay. Now from day two and day three and day four, then you've been at my house before. So you probably know where I live and there's a very good chance you'll remember where I am and how to get there. So you might not need your GPS. The DNS works in the same manner. That is called your computer's DNS cache. So in real life, you're going to remember how to get there because you've been there recently enough. But let's say after the A-plus course, after you've attended the whole course at my house, Maybe six months or 12 months goes by. At that point in time, even though you've actually been at my house, you might not remember how to get there because it's been too long. The very first day of, let's say, the N plus course, if you want to come for N plus then, you might have to resort to using your GPS all over again. And then from day two and day three, you would remember how to get to my house. DNS is once again the same thing. So if you've been to a website once, your machine will not ask the second time how to get to that website because it remembers. But if it hasn't been to a certain website in ages, maybe months or years, eventually that, that information is going to be removed from your DNS cache. And if you go to that website again in two years or so, it might ask the DNS again, okay, listen, my bro, I don't remember how to get to this website. Can you help me out? So that is essentially what a DNS does, guys. But I can probably go a lot further than that. But this course is not about DNS. Then we've got something called static versus dynamic configuration. What do we mean by that? We mean the different types of addresses you get, IP addresses. So with IP addresses, all machines, laptops, desktops, phones, and tablets, and whatever these days, 
they are normally on dynamic configuration by default. So that means you're going to turn that device on, you're going to connect it to a network via cable or wireless, and as soon as you do that, it's going to go and ask for an IP address. It doesn't have one. It's going to get one automatically from the network which it's connecting to. So if you're connecting to your home Wi-Fi or your office Wi-Fi, you would get one from the DHCP server. This might be built into your router. It could be an actual server. So you're going to get an IP from the DHCP, and that device will be able to go and browse the internet and do whatever. Now, static, folks, is when you or a user go and configure an IP address manually on a device. We don't do that as often as we used to, but you can go and do that. Now, a static IP address, believe it or not, is also known as a fixed IP address. So you can call this static, you can call this fixed. Some people even call this a manual IP address. Potato, potato, it's all the same thing. And when you configure that or the user configures that, that IP will not change. That device will not ask for an IP address and it will stay on that IP until you or someone goes back in there one day and manually go and change it. Other than that, it's not going to change, guys. All right, so the next topic we've got here is something we did kind of cover, Windows client configuration. So I kind of accidentally covered some of this, but we'll go through it again. So we're looking at the topic of IP version 4 properties more specifically. I just told you guys, when it comes to IP addresses, what are we on by default? We are on dynamic. That means the IP address is going to be sent to your device over the network as soon as it asks for one. So your device is going to obtain an IP address automatically. Where does it get this from? Folks, it gets it from something called the DHCP. What or where is the DHCP? As I've said before, the DHCP can either be built into your router, because pretty much all routers have this, and it's normally turned on by default, or if you're looking at a medium to large size company, this will probably be an actual DHCP server, and in that company, they normally went ahead and they turned off the DHCP functionality on their router. The reason why they prefer a server is because you've got a heck of a lot more control over it, and you've got way more functionality and features with regards to that. Then we've got static configuration, which I also just explained to you guys a couple of moments ago. So that is when you've got an IP address, which has been configured manually. It's also called a manual IP. It's called a static IP. It's called a fixed IP. So you configure it manually, and it will not change until you or someone changes this one day. Now, as for these two topics, since we're covering it for the second time, let me show you, folks, how we actually do this practically on a machine. I've got a bit of a virtual machine running in the background. I believe it's got Windows 10 installed. Not that it matters. It could be Windows 10. It could be Windows 11. It's all the same in the end of the day. So I think mine is slightly outdated, but I should still be able to get the message across. All right. Let's switch over to that VM. A few moments later. Here we are, folks, on that Windows 10 machine of mine. So it's slightly outdated. It hasn't run in a while, so I need to go and update it. So normally where the average Joe would go to go and configure their IP address configurations would probably be to go to the bottom right here where you guys can see next to the system clock. You would either go and right-click on the little computer icon if you've got a cable plugged into your machine. Um, if you're on a wireless communication or connection of some kind, you probably see some sort of Wi-Fi bars. Either way, same can of worms. If I right-click on my Windows 10 machine, it quickly says Open Network and Sharing Center. And that's what Windows 10 used to say in the beginning. But if you go look at the latest updates that came out on Windows 10, you'll find it no longer actually says Open Network and Sharing Center. I believe it says Network and Internet, if I'm not mistaken. And if you were to go to Network and Internet, there's actually a little link there that actually says Network and Sharing Center. So it's still going to take you to the same place in the end. So if I click on that, that is where I would like to end up. Now, if you were to have the newer version of Windows 10, or if you're using Windows 11, it's probably going to say Network and Internet. And let me show you guys what that would probably look like. I'm going to go here to the Settings app. Give it a moment. And there is the Network and Internet. So that's the place you would have gone to normally now if you go to the newer version of Windows 10 or version of Windows 11. It's going to go there, you're going to see tabs on the left, one says Ethernet, one says Wireless, and if you want to go and configure your network cables, you go click on Ethernet. If you're on a wireless communication network of some kind, you click on the Wi-Fi option. So let me close that. This is where I prefer to go and do things. It'll show you whether you're on the Ethernet cable or whether you're on wireless. I'm going to go click there. I'm going to go here to where it says Properties. 
I'll obviously zoom in on these sections for you guys so you can see a little bit more clearly what the heck I'm talking about. So this is the part I was talking about earlier. Up until Windows XP, we only had IP version 4. And then towards the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, they went ahead and added this little dookie hickey here, IP version 6. So getting to IP version 4, that's the only one you guys need to worry about for now when it comes to A+. We go here where it says properties. Now at the moment, on this Verge machine, I have a static IP address, a fixed IP address, or I suppose you can also call this a manual IP address. That's not actually what it looks like by default. Mine looks like that because I was using this virtual machine for something. That is what it looks like by default. You would normally see that on the average laptop, desktop, server, tablet, phone, whatever. So that's what normally it looks like. That says obtain an IP address automatically. That is considered dynamic, folks. So as soon as I plug a cable into this machine or I were to go and connect this machine to a wireless network, uh, if it was already connected to the network, I, this would basically be as soon as you turn it back on. It's going to go and see, oh, hang on a moment. I don't have an IP address. Your machine or your client's machine would then go and do a bit of an ARP request. Say, hello, is there anyone out there? Is there a DHCP out there? And if there is a DHCP on a network, it will reply. It's going to say, hey, how can I help you? And your machine is going to say, I need an IP address. The DHCP is going to offer your machine an IP address. Your machine is going to have a look at it and say, okay, cool, I'll take it. And then the DHCP will go and give your machine that IP address. Now, in the beginning, when your machine said, hello, is there a DHCP on a network? That's basically a broadcast of sorts. And anything that's on a network, not just the DHCP, would actually receive that. But anything that's on a network that is not the DHCP would receive that, but drop it. You can kind of think of this as standing in a big room or a big building of lots of people and when you yell out someone's name, everybody who is not that person, they'll hear you yelling, but they're not going to answer you because they know it is not them that you're calling. You're calling another person by their name. And if that person is in the room or in the building, they would hear you, well, hopefully, and they would respond to you. That's the same. That's the idea here. Now, when that DHCP gives you that offer, and gives you that IP address. Same can of worms, guys. Everybody in the room will hear that person talking back to you, but once again, they will ignore that person because they know the conversation's got nothing to do with them. That person's talking to you, so they will ignore that. So this is the same can of worms when a DHCP actually makes you an offer of an IP address and gives you an IP address. All the other machines on it will also get that, but they will know it's not for them, so they'll just, well, drop it. So that, folks, is dynamic. If you were to go here, there you can go in and put in a, a static IP address of sorts. Let me just go put it like that. Here we go. A static IP of sorts. There you can go and put in your subnet mask. This is basically how big your network is, how many times it's been subdivided, that kind of stuff. Now, by default, the average person will probably see triple two five five dot zero, which is what we see in front of us. That is a class C network. That is something you guys do need to know for this course and for the exam, but it's not a topic today. Class C network is probably one of the smallest kinds of networks you get. Now, if it's a zero at the end, that means we've got the full class C to ourselves. That is 256 IP addresses of 244 that's actually usable. The first one and the last one is not usable. If that 255 were to be anything other than 255, and you only see these two in the front as 255, that would mean you've got a class B network, which is approximately 16,500 and something IP addresses. A heck of a lot more. If only the front one was 255, that would mean you've got a class A IP address. And that's approximately 16 million something IP addresses. Or up to 16 million something IP addresses. Once again, not the topic right now. I'm just mentioning it since I've got it open in front of you guys. There is the default gateway we spoke of earlier. That would be the first device that you or the user have to hit or go through to get to the outside world. And in most cases, if this is a small network, that'll probably be the IP address of your router. If it's a relatively big network, it might be the IP of something like the firewall. The DNS is the server that's going to be converting those names to IPs and vice versa, which we spoke of earlier. All right, folks, I'm going to close this for a moment. Maybe we'll use this virtual machine again later in the course. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the course. So let's go back to my list of topics. All right, so here we are again. I would say we have covered the Windows client configuration topic. Let's move on.
Windows Defender Firewall. Now, once again, if you go look at the original version of Windows 10 that came out, if you go into something like the control panel, for those of you that know what that is, you would find the firewall is listed as Windows Firewall. But if you look at on the newer versions of Windows 10, the ones that's actually been updated, you'd find the icon's name has changed. The icon still looks the same, but now it doesn't say Windows Firewall, it says Windows Defender Firewall. Ooh, fancy. But everything else is exactly the same and it works exactly the same. You go about configuring, configuring it exactly the same, so I wouldn't worry about it, guys. So there's a couple of pictures for you guys. It's not really the best picture, so I think once again, it's probably going to be better if I go into the Windows Defender file and show you guys how this actually looks and how it goes and how it works and all that stuff. I actually went, yeah, so we're actually going into that virtual machine a heck of a lot quicker than what I thought. I thought we might not even use it for the rest of the course, and here we are, literally on the next topic, jumping back to that virtual machine. Weird, right? Anyway, going back to the virtual machine. A few moments later. Here we are again, folks. So I'm going to go and start things off by going to the good old fashioned control panel. How you guys get to that, that is up to you guys. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to go to the bottom here and I'm just going to go and type in control panel. There we go. You can see it's really popping up. In the control panel, I'm going to go to system and security because firewall is security after all. I'm going to go in there. And you can see this virtual machine still says Windows Firewall because it has not been updated. But if you've got an up-to-date version of Windows 10, even if you're running Windows 11, and you go to Control Panel, you'll find um, the icon still looks the same on Windows 10. Windows 11 it looks slightly different, but you'll find it the same place. But on both of them, it now says Windows Defender Firewall. So I'm going to click on that. From this point forward, it should look identical to everybody here. It doesn't matter whether you're using Windows 10 or 11, whether it's up to date or not, it looks the same for all of us. Mine is currently turned off, that's a bad thing. You would, you actually ideally want this thing to be turned on, unless you've got some sort of third-party firewall um, installed in your machine. Those normally tend to uninstall or turn off the Windows firewall automatically. And as soon as you uninstall the third-party firewall, it'll go and turn back on the Windows file automatically. So let me just quickly turn this bugger back on quickly. There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, not really part of the course, I'm just doing it so that I remember to go and do it. So regarding the Windows Defender Firewall, first place you can go and have a look-see is at the top left where it says, allow an app or a feature through the Windows Firewall. If any of you folks were to actually go in there, this is what you would see. Uh, if this machine is not joined to a domain, you would only see the first two rows here on the right. You would see private and public. If your machine has been joined to a domain, you would see this third row here, which says domain. Now mine actually allows me to go and tweak this and configure this, but if yours does not, all you need to do is just click on the top right where it says change settings, and it will actually enable these buttons and it will allow you to go and configure them. So you're gonna go through here and you're gonna go and allow or block whatever it is you wanna go and allow or block. A good example will probably be remote desktop because that's normally blocked for most folks by default. Let's go back a step. The one that most people tend to use a little bit more commonly, more often, is the one that says Advanced Settings. If you were to go and click on Advanced Settings, this is more or less what you guys are going to see. There we go. Now, it looks a bit overwhelming in the beginning. It looks like you need a NASA degree to be able to go and configure this. But, remember, there's an old saying. It says, don't judge a book by its cover. This is probably applicable here. So if you go here to the left, you'll find we have what we call inbound rules and outbound rules. The way you configure them is exactly the same for both, so it's your choice which one you want to go and do. For the most part, you will find there's only green things in this list, which means that item, that component or whatever it is, has been allowed through the firewall. So we can pretty much say safely that almost everything, if not everything, is allowed on your machine by default. I did not make these rules in case you guys are wondering. They're built into Windows by default. So inbound is things that you are not necessarily aware of because they're coming in from the outside. Outbound are things that we may or may not actually know about because it's coming from your environment. If I want to block something, how do we do it? You go to the top right side where it says new rule. You click there. You can choose whether you want to block or allow a program by browsing to it on your machine if you know where it's installed. Block or allow a port, if you know the port number for the program in question, you could actually block or allow more than one program in one go. Do you want to go and use something from this list? You can think of these as templates. 
I don't recommend this one because even though it looks pretty long, this list and pretty complicated, it is very limited, guys. It's very limited. It only shows you stuff built into Windows, and even then, it does not show you everything. So I wouldn't suggest that one unless you know the item you're looking for is definitely in that list. And then, of course, we've got the one here that says Custom. So I think the one that most people will go and use, including myself, is normally the top two here. My personal favorite, of course, being Port. I'm going to go with Port because that's the most complicated. So let me start explaining the most complicated one. Next, do you want to block or allow a TCP port or a UDP port? Now, if you don't know what kind of port you're dealing with for the item that you want to go and block, I would suggest you go with TCP because most things live are TCP, not UDP. UDP is one-way traffic. TCP is two-way traffic. An example of one-way traffic would probably be some sort of VoIP traffic. So that would be something like a Microsoft Teams call, Zoom call. If you're still using Skype for business, there'll be a Skype for business call. That's an example of UDP traffic. Almost everything else is, for the most part, TCP traffic. Um, if you want to make extra sure, I would suggest maybe just going to a search engine like Google and just running a search for that port number and just checking if it's TCP or UDP. But if you're not sure, I would say go TCP. You're probably going to guess it right. Here at the bottom, you can go and block or allow a port number, as you guys can see. You can do more than one, and if you want to do that, you just need to separate them with commas. So let's say I want to go and block port 80, which is normal HTTP. In other words, normal clear text web browsing. Next, do you want to allow or block this port? Probably block because everything is allowed by default anyway. Next, for which networks do you want to do this for? Next, and then lastly, this is the last step, guys. Give it a name and a description. Now, some of you guys might think this is not that important. I suppose it might not be. But I am going to recommend that you folks go and use a user-friendly and a professional name. The same goes with description because you never know. You might come back to this PC six months or 12 months later. This might be for a client. And you see stuff that's blocking stuff and you've got no idea why they were made or what their purpose is. It's also a courtesy to federal technicians that might come to this machine down the line. So maybe six months later, another technician is going to come onto this machine. They're going to do troubleshooting of sorts. They're going to see stuff is blocked, but now they don't know what is blocked or why it's blocked. So it's a courtesy to fellow technicians to allow them to know what the heck this is and why it was done in the first place. So I'm going to click on cancel here, guys. Otherwise, I'm really going to end up blocking web browsing on this machine, and that's not going to be nice. Let's go back to our list of topics once more. So I think we can safely say we've covered Windows Defender. Let's move on to proxy settings. All right, so there's a bit of a picture for you guys. A proxy, for those of you that don't know, if we come at this from an IT perspective, this is kind of like a bouncer at the door. So if you are at your home on your machine, on your internet connection, and you try to go to websites online, especially if it's websites that's not so nice, let's say they are not so legal, then you can do what you want because it's your machine, it's your internet. But when you go to the office, chances are you might be using the office machine. Maybe it's yours, maybe it's not. But even more so, you are using the office network, their internet. And there you cannot always just do whatever you want because there's various things that's going to be blocking you. One of which is the proxy, guys. The proxy is the middleman that you've got to go through at the office, this is not applicable to all offices, it's actually being phased out now because it's not that effective, but it's a middleman. So on the proxy, your company or your administrator, it's probably going to be you guys, you get to specify what websites your users can go and access and which ones they cannot. That's basically what it does in a nutshell. So if your staff is not allowed to go to, let's say, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and LinkedIn, etc., etc., all those social media websites, because we know they're not going to be doing their work then. You can go to a proxy server. You can go and block those websites. And if your users wants to go to those websites, they've got to go through the proxy to get to those websites. And when they go through the proxy, every time they want to go to a website, the proxy is going to say, whoa, buddy, back up, back up. Where are you going? And then your PC is going to say, I'm going to Facebook. And the proxy is going to check. Basically, you can imagine like a clipboard with a list of items of which is allowed and which is not. It's going to say, uh, nope, sorry, buddy. Facebook is on the no-no list. You are not allowed to pass on through. So if you're trying to go to a legitimate source like Google or something work-related, it'll allow you through. But if you're trying to go to a source that is not legitimate, something that you are not supposed to go to, it's not going to allow you through. So you can think of this as commandments. Thou shall not go onto Facebook. 
Val shall not go onto YouTube. And if it sees Val trying to go to Facebook, it's going to block you. Now, one of the reasons why this is being phased out, guys, is because it's not very effective. There's many, many other things out there, Microsoft and otherwise, that's way more effective. Proxy servers, even people that's not in IT, can bypass this one way or another. You can either go and encrypt yourself, and when I say encrypt, I don't mean anything fancy. You could literally just go to your browser and use the, you know, the built-in encryption. So if it's Chrome, I think it's called incognito. I can't even pronounce that word about butchering it. Um, if it's Internet Explorer, I, thought, I think it's called in private browsing. If it's Firefox, I think it's just called private browsing. And there's quite a few other browsers that's got something similar. So what that's going to do is if you use that function, it's going to open an extra browser and it'll force all websites or all pages to load an HTTPS, not HTTP. HTTP is clear text, which means people and stuff can see what you're doing. S means it's encrypted. So something like a proxy server or anyone in the middle will not be able to see what you're doing. So that's one way to bypass a proxy, and that's another reason why it's no longer really enforced. You can pretend to be one thing. We're actually doing something else. So I can go to a proxy online website, and I can just type in something like Facebook or YouTube onto that site, and that'll allow me to load Facebook or YouTube in that site while I'm actually on Facebook or YouTube. I don't recommend that because it's very risky, especially if you have to log into something, but something safe would probably be to go to Google Translate. If you were to go and run a search for Google Translate in Google, You'd find it can translate words, sentences, phrases, documents, and whole websites. And if you go to go and type in a website there, you can pretend it's in any language, not that it matters. Just choose English if you want to translate it to English, even though it actually is in English. It's going to give you a URL, a URL to go and click on. When you click on that, it's going to load Facebook within Google Translate. And the proxy will see you as if you are on Google Translate when in reality, you are actually on Facebook. And there's many other ways. I mean, you can go bounce yourself off other proxies, which you can think of as trying to see behind a wall, but you can't. But what if you put a mirror on the side of the wall and you can go and peek behind a wall? That's kind of like bouncing yourself off another proxy. All right, folks, we've reached the end of the first section in this module. Phew. That is a lot. I mean, you guys can see this is going to be one of those big modules. I mean, it's probably already 30, 40 minutes into the video. And we've only finished the first section of four sections. So I'm really hoping the other sections won't take as long. If it does, I apologize. That is the content, guys. I'm delivering it as it is intended. So within this second section, um, let me first give you the name. So the second section is called Troubleshooting Windows Networking. So within this second section, the first topic up is troubleshoot IP configuration. So this is all about troubleshooting IP related issues for the most part, you know, to go and check your IP. Do you have the right IP? If not, why don't you have it to go and release it to get a new one? That kinds of stuff. So there's a bit of a picture for you guys of one of the commands. You can see there way at the top, the user, that was me went and typed in ipconfig forward slash all. And that command essentially will show you, for the most part, everything you need to know about your network configurations on that particular machine. But we're jumping the gun. So the very first command I want to bring your attention to is actually one that's not in the course, which I find strange. I added this one to the list myself, and that would be ipconfig. If you were to go to command prompt, in other words, CMD, and you type in ipconfig, as is, as you guys can see there as I typed it, you just type in ipconfig, that would show you that device's network configuration, but just the basics. It'll show you the IP address. It will show you the subnet mask, just the basics of the basics. So it's a basic overview of a device's network configuration. I'm adding that one for you guys in extra. Now there's four other commands I'm gonna show you guys now, and those four are actually in fact in the course, they were originally on this list. So the second one here is ipconfig forward slash all, which is the one you guys can actually see there in the picture on the right. That shows you the same information as the normal IP, ipconfig command, the one I mentioned previously, but it shows you a heck of a lot more. So if you look at that picture on the right, that command you can see will also show you other information. It'll show you your IP version 6 address if you've got one. It'll show you whether your IP is dynamic or static. It'll show you your DNS. It'll show you a whole bunch of other stuff. It'll show you your physical address, which is your MAC address, a whole lot of extra information. 
other commands we're going to be discussing, and we'll do this as in a moment, is ipconfig forward slash release, ipconfig forward slash renew, and ipconfig forward slash uh, flush DNS. So starting with the third one there on the list, ipconfig forward slash release. That command, folks, is something you would type into command prompt to release your IP address if, there's a big if here, if you've got a dynamic IP address and if you've got an IP address to begin with. So assuming your device or the user's device is configured on dynamic and not static, this does not work on static, if you're on dynamic and if you've got an IP address, you can type that command into command prompt and it will release the IP address that you've got and it'll go back to the DHCP. So this is basically the same as plugging your network cable out of the machine or disconnecting from the Wi-Fi or just quite frankly turning the machine off. As soon as you do any of those things, the IP address that your machine has gets released and it goes back to the DHCP. And if you were to go and start the machine back up or if you were to go and reconnect the cable you just plugged out or reconnect to the Wi-Fi you just disconnected from, then your machine's going to go and ask for an IP address all over again. That brings us to the fourth command on this list, which is ipconfig forward slash renew. Renew is to ask for a new IP address. That's the same as plugging yourself back in, connecting to the Wi-Fi, or starting the machine. That's what ipconfig renew does. The last one on the list, ipconfig forward slash flush DNS, is to go and wipe your DNS cache. You would remember earlier, in the previous section, we spoke about DNS. I told you DNS has got something called DNS cache, which is like a temporary memory. It's like your short-term memory. And if you want your PC to forget its short-term memory of which websites it has visited recently, there's very good reasons why you want, want to do that sometimes. But if you want to do that, if you need to do that, that, folks, is the command. Now, regarding ipconfig forward slash flush DNS, guys, make sure you understand especially that command because not only is there a question in the exam about that, there is a PBQ in the exam about that. If you don't know what PBQ stands for, it means performance-based question. Some folks call this simulations. It's an actual practical exercise in the exam that you'll be required to go and do. In the exam, you'll be presented with a black screen, command prompt, and you're going to be tasked with wiping the DNS cache of that machine. I can't remember if they give you a reason as to why this needs to happen. This is something we almost never do in real life. But the point is, you need to go and do that. And the way you do that is to type in that command. Just that command. You're going to go type ipconfig forward slash flush DNS. That would have wiped the DNS cache, the temporary memory of that machine. And every website that machine tries to visit from this point forward, it'll still work just like normal. But you're going to force that machine to ask the DNS all over again where each and every one of these websites are. So that's what flush DNS is. Watch out. There's a PBQ in the exam about that. Now, do they ask about the other commands I've shown you guys? Yes, they do. But those ones are not PBQs. Those are just normal theory-based questions. And if you understand what the commands does, you'll get those questions right. So I'm just going to quickly switch over to that virtual machine again and just show you guys what it looks like when we type these commands. I'm probably not going to be able to show you all of them because my machine is a virtual machine. It's not connected to the internet. But I can try my best. So let's, let's switch over. Like usual, folks, here we are on a trusty virtual machine of mine, that Windows 10 machine. So I'm going to go here to the bottom left where it says Cortana, my search engine. I'm going to open command prompt like so. There we go. If you're wondering how I got my text to be green, that's got nothing to do because I literally just went in here, properties, colors, and I just chose for the text here to be green. So that's got absolutely nothing to do with the course. It's not an exam. It's just something cool you guys can go and do a command prompt if you're wondering how the heck I got my text to be green. It just looks cool, doesn't it? Now, anyway, getting back to the actual topics, the first command we had on that list was ipconfig. So if I go and type in ipconfig just as is, as you guys can see there, that, let me press enter here, shows me just the basic network information about this machine. You can see there is the IP address we configured manually earlier on this machine. So that's a static IP address. It's a manual one or a fixed one. It's most certainly not a dynamic IP address. So if I were to go and use that other command on the list, the one that says ipconfig release, would it work on this IP address? No, it would not. 
because it only works on dynamic IP addresses you've gotten from a DHCP. We did not get this IP from DHCP. We typed it in manually, or at least someone did. If I scroll down a little bit further and I go and type in ipconfig forward slash all, it's going to show me the same information but a heck of a lot more. So if I press enter now, you see what happens now. Let's scroll, scroll, scroll up. You can see there is where the command starts. All of this part here is new. So you can see previously it was very short. So this is the previous part right there. That's the previous part. Check how much longer this thing is now. There's a lot more information. So I can see my pretend pretend domain. I can go and see my physical address now, something I could not see previously. I can go and see maybe my default gateway, my DNS, a whole bunch of information that I can see now. I can see that this thing is on dynamic. It says auto configuration enabled. Yes, that means I'm on dynamic IP address. There's, there's quite a few things you can actually go and see here. Other commands we had was ipconfig forward slash release. Now, in my case, that's not going to work for more than one reason. First reason is because I'm on, st on a static IP address, so that's not going to work. Second reason is this machine of mine is not actually connected to any network right now, so that's also not going to work. So even if I go and put it on dynamic, it's not going to get any IP address because I have not connected it to any vir virtual switch, for those of you who know what that is. So you're just going to type that in on, an IP on a machine that's got a dynamic IP. You press enter, it takes about one or two seconds. Boom, you're done. It would have released the IP. Then, once you've done that, you follow up with this command, ipconfig forward slash renew. Now, this does not take one or two seconds, guys. It might, but in all honesty, I've seen this normally takes about two to five minutes. It takes quite a while for this command to engage. You're actually better off just restarting the machine. That's going to go a heck of a lot quicker than doing this. So I would only recommend using this as a last resort if all else fails. You preferably want to avoid this command. So you just need to know what it does from an exam perspective. But that's it. The last one was ipconfig flush DNS, which erases your, well, DNS cache. Now, I want to show you guys something else here. If I were to go and type in ipconfig like I did earlier, you can see where I went and typed ipconfig. What is my IP address currently? It's 192.168.0.5. So that is a IP address of sorts. Now, does anyone know what it actually looks like when you do not have an IP address. I'm going to try and simulate that. So let's go here to the bottom right. I'm going to go and erase that IP. I'm going to go here. Let's go and remove that IP. Let's go there. I'm going to erase it. So I'm going to tell this machine now to go and get one automatically. It's not going to get one because like I said, this virtual machine is not connected to any network. It's just not going to get anything. It's going to have nada. It's not going to have anything. So let's close this for a moment. Let's show you guys what it actually looks like now when you don't have an IP. It's going to look at, at first glance like you've got an IP, but in the reality, it's just going to say 169.254. something else. Dot something else, and that means you don't have an IP address. So let's go check it out once more. Here's the command. Observe the IP now. It has changed. Previously, that was my IP. Then I went and changed it to dynamic, but it's not getting one. That might look like an IP, guys, but I assure you, it is not. Whenever you see 169.254 specifically, you can ignore the last two octets. If you see 169.254, that means you do not have an IP address. That means you've got a PIPA. I'm typing here at the bottom, so that's the name. It means you've got a PIPA. You don't need to know what the abbreviation of a PIPA stands for, you just need to know what a PIPA is. A PIPA means you don't have an IP address. If you're on dynamic or the device is on dynamic, it's unable to get an IP address, and it's up to you as a technician to figure out why that is. This can be for a million and one reasons. It can be because the network cable is unplugged. It can be because it's disconnected from the Wi-Fi. It can be because the DHCP is unavailable. It can be because the DHCP has run out of IP addresses. Yes, that can happen. It can be for many, many other reasons. The point is, you're unable to get an IP. All right. Now, let me tell you guys something else. I'm going to close command prompt for just a moment, and I'm going to open it again. We actually don't have the topic, but I want to show you guys something else because this is going to be a question in the exam. So I feel I, I need to show you guys this. In the exam, there's a theory question. Most of the theory questions will be a normal question. We'll give you four possible answers of which you can only choose one. You choose that answer, and you click next, and you move on of your day. 
Now, some of these questions will be what we call exhibit questions. I believe I've mentioned this in some of the previous modules. That means they show you a screenshot of something, and if you don't look at the screenshot, it's impossible for you to know what the answer is. Now, looking at the screenshot, this is what you guys are going to see. You'll see that CompTIA has gone ahead and they typed in ipconfig or ipconfig slash all. I think they just typed in normal ipconfig. And they want you to observe something regarding this information. It's normally the IP address. And they're going to ask you, what command should user 1 or whatever user, let's call it user 1, what command should user 1 run first? And they're going to give you four answers. Two of them you can normally immediately eliminate with most of these questions. You can normally see two answers got nothing to do with the question at hand. And then the other two answers will normally be a 50-50 kind of scenario. The two answers they'll give you that that's going to be 50 50 is ipconfig forward slash renew and forward slash release. Now, which command did we have to type in earlier first? That was to release first. And that was followed by ipconfig renew. Now, renew is to ask for a new IP. Release is to release your current IP. If you look at this IP that we've got here right now, guys, do I have an IP address? No, I do not. So am I going to type an ipconfig forward slash release? No, because there is nothing to release, people. So what am I going to type in first? You're going to run the command ipconfig forward slash renew because you're going to skip the release part. You don't have an IP to release. You're just going to go and renew it. That's all you need to do. So that's normally what the question exam is, but I still want you guys to double check this. I can pretty much guarantee you it will be 169 or 254. But just in case it's not, because I don't trust CompTIA, you never know. They reserve the right to change this exam. So just in case, please double check me in the exam. If you see it as an actual IP address, then yes, your first command is to release. And then it'll be renewed. But if it's 169 or 254, then you know it is just to renew the IP address. Right, guys, I probably went way overboard on this topic, but I felt you need to know this because I know for a fact this is in the exam pool of questions. Some of you guys might get this, some of you guys might not get this. But if you're one of the unfortunate souls that actually does get this kind of question, you'll know what the answer is and you'll know why that is the answer because we've explained it to you. All right, so let's go back to our topics. Okay, so looking at this list, I feel we have pretty much covered this, probably way overboard, but at least now you guys will be able to pass this exam, because that's why you're watching this video course. So next up, I've got another command we need to deal with. It's one specifically. It is called, well, it's in the category called Troubleshoot Local Network Connectivity. Um, I feel we could have actually thrown this into the previous category, but hey, this is CompTIA. So the command, in case you guys wondering what it is, is called ping. Good old-fashioned ping. Many of you guys probably know this command already. There's a picture of you guys on the right of me running it. So I did this on my, on my virtual machine. You can see that screenshot is from my virtual machine. This was before I changed the text to green. So the idea of ping is to test remote connectivity from one device to another. Back in the day, we used to say test remote connectivity from one computer to another or one PC to another. But these days, we know it's not just computers. This can be to any device because you can connect almost any freaking thing to a network these days. So instead, we've rephrased this to device and device from one device to another device. So how do we run this command? You go into command prompt, you type in ping, like you can see in my picture, followed by space. And then you type in the IP address or the name of a device that you want to test connectivity to. Alternatively, you can type in the IP address or the name of the website. So if it's a website, you can go and type in ping space www dot and then whatever the website is. Maybe it's youtube.com. You can test connectivity to YouTube. What's going to happen then? Your machine will send four packets of data, like you can see in a screenshot. Four extremely small packets of data to that device. And should it receive it, it's going to send all four of them back. And you'll see what we see in a screenshot. It's going to say reply, 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 reply. That's what you want to see. Not just that, though. You also want to see how quickly it replies. You can see mine there, it says one millisecond. If you go look way on the right, it says time, and there's a little bracket there, and it says one ms, one millisecond. That's good. That means it's replying, and it is freaking fast. It doesn't help it replies, but it takes forever in a day to go and reply. That also means there's a problem. There's some sort of latency on a network, or something is causing a problem on a network, some sort of issue. So there might be latency for all we know. You never know. Now, if you 
get replies, let's say you get three replies and one of the replies says timeout or something in that regard. That means your configuration is correct because otherwise you would get no reply, but something is causing interference perhaps. This can be a power cable that's too near your network cable because that's causing EMI, electromagnetic interference. It can be because the LAN cable is too near a fluorescent light. It can be because of a damaged cable. It can be for many things. So if you see replies, but you see a couple of packets being dropped, that means your configuration is correct, but something is not a yoba on the network. Something is causing interference most likely. I'm not saying it is interference, but that's the most likely culprit here is some sort of interference. Now, if you don't get a reply at all, that is a bit of a problem because now you need to go and investigate. And the list of things that can cause this is very long, guys. It can be you don't have the right IP configured. It can be your subnet. It can be your default gateway. Uh, it can be a firewall blocking you. It can be so many things. I mean, it can even be a cable that's just not plugged in. It can be many things, guys. So that is ideally what ping is all about. That's all you need to know about it from the course perspective and the exam perspective. But for those of you that's curious where it gets its name from, if you can look at a good old fashioned action movie or a series, uh, one about submarines, you'll find I've got a radar there. And the radar is normally to go and check if anything is close by, especially something like a ship or a submarine. It sends out a pulse. And if it hits something solid, something metal, preferably like a ship or a submarine, it bounces the signal back. And depending on which direction it, comes, it takes to come back, the radar will tell you how far this item is and how big this item essentially is. And what sound does the radar make? It goes ping, ping. And what does it do when it sends out that pulse? It's an echo, like a dolphin. So the ping is the echo protocol. I kid you not, it's called the echo protocol because it works like an echo. It gets its name from the radars from submarines. Interesting, isn't it? You don't need to know that. It's just cool to tell you a story about that so then you know where it's getting its name from. All right, moving on. Troubleshoot remote network connectivity. Once again, guys, I've got the command for you guys. There is one command and one command only, and it's called Tracer. And then on the right, there's a picture of me running the command called Tracer. So that command, some folks are under the impression this allows you to go and trace where someone might actually be. Uh, no, that's not really what it's used for. It is to trace where there is an issue on the network. So if you are having an internet connection that's a bit unstable or off or it's all over the place, trace it can allow you to trace, like the name suggests, where the problem might be. So to run the command trace it, you're going to type in trace it space and then you're going to type in the IP address or the name of the device that you want to test connectivity to. It's usually going to be something online. So you want to go type in tracer space and an IP address or something online or a website online. You know, this can be www.facebook.com or something like that. You're going to type in trace it or this can even be Google for all we know. You can hit enter. And if you can see there on the right hand side towards the bottom of that screenshot, it'll show you to a maximum of 30 hops. Now, CompTIA and Microsoft says each hop is a router, which is not entirely true. It's just usually a router. So the very first hop is usually your own router. So if you're in a home environment or a small office environment, that first hop will be your router and your router's IP address. The second hop might be your ISP, the people that provide you your internet access, your internet service provider. The third hop will be whoever or whatever is beyond your ISP and etc. and etc. So it'll go between five and 10 on average, but it can go up to 30 folks. If you are in a medium to a large size organization, remember what is your default gateway in those companies? The first one, the first device you've got to hit is normally something like a firewall. So that first hop will not be your router guys. It will in fact be your firewall. The second hop will be your router. The third hop will be your ISP, and then the fourth hop will be something beyond your ISP. So this is going to allow you to establish where the problem is. So if the second hop times out or takes long to respond, then this might be in your, in your building. So if you've got a firewall and the second hop takes long to time out or to respond, that means it's inside your network. It's something to do with your, your router, something to do with your router. That's more or less what the problem is. If it times out on the first one, you know, okay, it's the firewall. If it times out on the third hop, then you know, oh, it's the ISP. You should go and contact them, log a ticket, 
go and yell at them on the phone or something. If it times out beyond the third half, then it's actually not the ISP. Most customers will go and contact the ISP. The ISP is going to be professional, polite. And they're going to say, our oh, technicians are looking into the matter, even though they're actually not. They're just going to be watching funny cat videos on YouTube or something. And they are essentially going to wait for the problem to go and resolve itself. And eventually when it resolves itself, they will contact you back and say the ticket has been closed. Our technicians have worked tirelessly to fix this issue for you. And here you go. They've closed the ticket. Meanwhile, they didn't do anything. <laughs> so yeah, guys, that's actually what happens. It all depends on where the problem actually is. So this is to trace a problem. Where the hop, where the hop is being dropped, where it is giving you some sort of grief. Right, folks, so that once again brings us to the end of another section. So this one went a little bit quicker. So that's the end of section two, I believe. Now moving to the third section, which is called Configure Windows Security Settings. In this section, the first topic we've got up, folks, is Logical Security Controls. And even though that's what the title says of this topic, that's not entirely everything that's going to be in this list. Well, at least it doesn't feel like it to me. So here we've got security control types. And if you go look at that, we've got physical, procedural, and logical. So physical control type, I don't I think we all know what that is. I mean, that would be something like a boom gate, a door, a fence, a padlock, you know. So I think you guys get the idea of what physical security is. Procedural, there's many things that can that can classify as procedural. I suppose it depends on your imagination. So maybe. If I want to go and swap a hard drive in a server that has failed, even though I know how to and I can physically go and do it, I'm not allowed to just go and do that. There's documentation that might need to be completed first. And on this documentation, I need to go and specify who is changing it, when they're changing it, why they're changing it, what is happening to the old hard drive that has failed, that kind of stuff. It is procedural. It's only an example of procedure. There can probably be many. Then you've got logical, which is for the most part digital and software based. Now, speaking of logical, here we've got logical security. And in the category of logical security, we've got access control system enforced by software. This can be an actual device at a door, um, although I don't think that's really what they've got in mind here. Or it can be you on a computer or a cell phone or a tablet, it's probably going to be a computer, and you're trying to log in and something is stopping you. So this can probably be some form of authentication that needs to be provided first, where you essentially prove that you are who or what you claim to be. Now, speaking of proving you are who you claim to be, we've got authentication, authorization, and accounting. I believe we've mentioned these before in the course. You know, we, we talked about the triple A, but I'll mention it again. So the first A in triple A is authentication, where you essentially claim or prove you are who you claim to be or what you claim to be. This can be done by providing something like a username and a password, email address and a password, a PIN. You know, this can be an actual object you present like a card, smart card, pump. Uh, maybe you need to provide an OTP. Maybe you need to provide a fingerprint. You know, you get the idea. So you can think of authentication as step one. Step two would be authorization. Uh, they're not really called step one and two, by the way. I'm just making this up because it's easy to understand. Um, accounting would not be step three. That's just something else. So authorization, step two, is to check what level of access do you have once you have been authenticated. So once you've proven you are who you claim to be, you are indeed a member or an employee of this company, for example, or you are indeed the owner to this device or this account, authorization will then check what level of access do you have as that user. Now, step two does not always take place. I mean, if you look at something like your own personal device, your personal account, like your Facebook or Gmail or something, once you've logged in, you for the most part have full blown access. So it doesn't really apply there. So, a good example might be something like a company domain. If you log in something like a company domain, it's going to go and check what level of access do you have. So in my case, it might say, oh, you are a trainer. Oh, sorry, bud. You only have access to, well, pretty much whatever you would expect a trainer to have access to. Slides, books, manuals, labs, that kind of stuff. Or it might say, oh, hang on a bit. You are an administrator. You are a manager. And, you know, you might potentially have access to a lot of things, you know, depending on what kind of person you are. So that is authorization. 
accounting is for just keeping logs or everything because everything on a machine is always logged who logged in where and did what when where that kinds of stuff here we've got access control lists you've got many kinds of access control lists one of the more common ones you guys are probably going to be dealing with is the actual kind you get on actual devices like a switch i'm talking about those fancy kinds of native creatures those managed switches which normally cost a lot of money those kinds you can actually go and log into so if you look at something like a cisco switch or something in that regard you can actually log on to these devices they've got their own operating system and you can go and control an access list it's going to go and check where traffic is coming from and where it's going to and depending on where it's coming from or where it's going to it'll either deny or allow the traffic based on source or destination but access control list guys is not just limited to that it can be a lot of things we've got something called implicit deny this can be on many places where we go and configure this, but it's most commonly something I tend to see on actual firewalls. So the idea is to block everything and anything, and everything will be blocked by default unless there's a rule that specifically says allow. So if you go and physically install a firewall at a company, I used to do this many, many times at many companies. When I go to a company to go and install a physical firewall, this was even the government's, I would start off by blocking absolutely everything. All websites, all URLs, all IP addresses, all services, absolutely everything gets blocked. And then using a predefined list, you can think of it as a checklist, I will then one by one go and allow what needs to be allowed in that specific company. If certain sites need to be allowed, I will allow them. If certain IPs need to be allowed, and etc., etc., then I will allow them. Now there's bound to be a couple of growing pains in the beginning where you accidentally blocked something which is not supposed to be blocked, but rather have something accidentally blocked than having something accidentally allowed because that is a vulnerability in your company. And anyone that knows something about something can obviously take advantage of that and before you know it, you are being hacked. So that's basically what implicit deny comes down to. The last one I've got on this list for you guys is least privilege. It's one of those golden rules in IT. It's not just limited to, to A plus guys or CompTIA. It is a golden rule in IT in general. You never give someone or something more permission or more privilege than what they need to achieve a task or a goal. And this actually includes yourself. So this is not just because we don't trust people, although that's one of the reasons. It is also in case someone's account gets compromised, which is why I'm also throwing you into this list. So one day is one day, your account will get hacked. It's not if, but when, it's inevitable. It's gonna happen at some point in time. So what we wanna do is, we wanna limit the amount of privileges we've got. At many of my clients, I was the main, main administrator. I suppose you could call me the main cheese, but yet I would not use the main admin account unless I absolutely needed to. I would go make myself a very limited admin account or a normal user account, depending on what I am doing in that company on that particular day. That limited admin account or that normal limited user account is what I would use to do my normal day-to-day -day tasks. And only when I absolutely need to, would I go and use the main admin account. Now, am I going to stop hackers by using it in that way? No, you can never stop them. All I want to achieve here is by just massively reducing the chances of that account being compromised. Because if I'm not using it, the chances of it being compromised is obviously a heck of a lot less. And uh, obviously, if you own users, the reason why we want to limit them is not just because they might get compromised. It's also because you get employees that's just plain mean. Some of them go rogue. They are what we call disgruntled employees, according to CompTIA. I suppose that's a nice way of phrasing it. They are essentially upset because they did not get something, perhaps. They did not get that bonus they were hoping for, that increase they were hoping for, that promotion they were hoping for. Sometimes it's for silly childish reasons. Sometimes it just seems to them like the boss is giving someone else attention, maybe not even more attention, just equal attention. And they're like kids that they want all the attention to themselves and now they go and act out and they go and do damage, delete stuff, sabotage stuff or whatever. So when we give our employees least privilege, it is to also limit the amount of damage they can do should they go rogue. So we're not saying they're not going to do any damage. They probably will still do damage. They will still be able to see certain things, but we want to limit the amount of damage they can do. And we want to limit what they can see. It's a form of damage control, I suppose.
Right, next up we've got something called user and group accounts. Now I think for the most part, most of you guys know what a user account is. Maybe not what a group account is, but you, you should at least know what a user account is. So I'm gonna add a bit of a picture here for you guys on the right. That's more or less what it looked like. I, probably, I think it's probably gonna look better if I go into a virtual machine. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that. So user accounts is what you or the user would use to log into the device or an account online. So let's just say this is a computer to keep things simple. So on your machine, you're going to go and choose an account or you're going to type in an account. Uh, we can pretend for the purposes of this demonstration, this is just a machine that's not been joined to the domain yet. So you're going to click your account, you're going to type in the password if there's any, and there you go. You're logged in. That is a user account. On a local machine, you get different kinds of accounts. You get administrator accounts, which I think is probably the most well known. You also get what we call standard accounts and quite a few other ones. The only ones you need to pretty much know about at this point in time is administrator and standard accounts. Now at this point in time, almost everybody and their uncle is an administrator on their machines. But that was not always the case. If you go back as recently as five to 10 years, let's say 10 years back in time, if you were at a company back then, they didn't exactly use remote so much, remote technologies, cloud and virtual technologies. Everything was back, was, was old school on premises. And you know, even the technology was pretty much old school back then. If someone wanted to install or uninstall something or configure something serious in the machine, it would pop up asking them for a username and a password. It would be a pop up on the screen. That is when they would call the administrator, which would be you, and you're gonna ask a couple of questions first before you give your password. You're gonna ask, what are you installing? Why are you installing it? And if it's something fishy, you're going to say no. If it's something legit, you're going to type in username and password and it will proceed. So that's basically what this is all about. So the average user used to be a standard user and that would limit them from installing, uninstalling stuff and configuring system changes. And us, we the IT people, would be administrators. Now, at this point in time where we are right now in present day, Every person needs to be able to install or uninstall stuff pretty much on a daily basis. Now, I absolutely do not want to go to every freaking user or nearly every user every day typing in usernames and passwords because there's just too many people in the average company. And quite frankly, I've got better things to do with my time. I've got other places to be. I've got other things to do. So instead, we just make all the people administrators on their own machines. They can do whatever they need to go and do. But... Now we use new technologies, new softwares, some of which is cloud softwares, where I can monitor these users and their devices. And if someone, God forbid, tries to install something, uninstall something, or configure something on a device which is not allowed, I will know about it. I can even have it automatically revert back to where it was. So this can be something like Microsoft Intune. Using Intune, I can scan your device and I can use compliancy policies. And using those compliance policies, I can enforce certain rules upon you and your device. So if you try and install something that's not allowed, it'll uninstall it or block you. If you try and uninstall something that's not allowed, it'll install it back or it'll just block you. And so on and so forth. So I think you guys get the idea when it comes to user accounts. You get admin, you get standard. Then we have what we call security groups. That would be something like an administrator group. But you also get backup operators group, power you know, users group. For the most part, we don't use any of these anymore. So they are groups that's got some sort of privilege, which is a little bit more than the average user, but not by much. The main one is the administrators group. So if you get thrown into that group, you are an administrator and you can do anything and everything that an administrator can go and do. If you have other groups on your computer, we're talking about the built-in ones or one you made afterwards, the idea is for someone to be thrown into that group and they will have the permissions or the privilege that that group provides which is normally less than an administrator, but more than a standard user. All right, and then the last topic here is managing your user and group accounts. So let me switch over to a virtual machine and just show you guys one of many ways to go and do this. And once again, I apologize for this module being so long. I've got no control over that. I'm covering the module as it needs to be. So at the end of the day, some modules are short, some of them are not. And this module just happens to have topics that take forever to explain. So anyway, switching over to the virtual machine, all right, folks, there is many ways you can get to user accounts and groups. Sometimes on some computers, you might get lucky by just going here to Cortana and just typing in users and groups. Other times, you might have to resort to using some sort of console or administrative tool. So I'm going to go into mmc.exe, which stands for Microsoft Management Console. And that allows you to go and add all kinds of administrative tools. 
and today I'm looking for the tool called users and groups. It's blank. I'm gonna go and add what is known as a snap-in file. Add and remove snap-ins and give it a moment. Here you will see a pretty decent list of some of the snap-ins, consoles, and administrative tools in Windows. It's not all of them, it's just a lot of them. And there is the one I'm looking for. Local users and groups. Add. Finish. Okay. And there we go. Local users and groups. So there's my user accounts. At the moment you can see administrator, default account, and guest. Those three will always be on your machine by default. They're built in by default. And all three of them are normally disabled by default. Burning eyes. That is the account I made when I installed Windows onto this machine. That one will vary from machine to machine. So it'll always be disabled. No, I mean, I'm lying. It'll be enabled. It's probably going to be the only one that's going to be enabled by default. But the name will be different from PC to PC. It depends on the account you've chosen, but you can always going to add more afterwards. Groups-wise, here is some of the built-in groups on Windows. I did not make any of these. These all come standard with Windows. You can see there's your administrators group. There is your users group, and that's actually considered standard users. It says users, but it's actually standard users. You can, at your discretion, you can go and create new groups here if need be. If you go back to users, you can, at your discretion, go and create a new user here if need be. Keeping in mind that the users and the groups you create here are strictly local. They're not on a domain, and they're not online. It's only on the device where you are at that specific moment. All right, folks, going on to our next topic. I believe we pretty much covered this topic of user and group accounts, so moving on. Next up, we've got the topic of user account control. And for those of you not familiar with this, this is commonly known as UAC for short. We just normally call it UAC. On the right-hand side is a picture of what it would look like once it pops up or what it would more or less do. So this is a concept or a tool or a feature or a function, you know, whatever you want to call it. It came out in the end of 2008 when they released Vista or Vista. They had a great idea, but it just didn't really work. So what happened back then, back in the day, yo, I feel very old, you know, when I say this. What happened back then is almost everything you or the user did on the machine, a pop-up would pop up pretty much like what we see in the screenshot there. Not exactly like that, but pretty much like that. It'll pop up and it'll ask you, are you sure you want to start that game or that program? Are you sure you want to close that game or that program? Or are you sure you want to open that or close that or change this or change that? It would do that for pretty much everything. Now that alone is very annoying, but it doesn't stop there, folks. The whole screen in the background would go completely black or very, very dark, like what you see in the picture there on the right. Very dark. And that's the only thing you could do. If you were an administrator, you just had to say yes or no the whole time. If you were a standard user, which was still very popular back in the day, you would have to ask the administrator for their password every couple of minutes. It was basically insane. It would make the administrator go insane. So it was just not an option. So what most of us ended up doing, we just ended up turning it off completely. Now, when Windows 7 was announced and when it was released, we had hope that Microsoft would address these issues and hopefully make them better, but not necessarily fix them entirely yet in the first go. Fortunately, Microsoft managed to fix this completely when they, re when they released Windows 7. So that is very, very nice to know. Finish fixed it completely. And uh, yeah. Anyway, let me show you guys what this looks like. I'm going to just quickly go to a virtual machine. Here we are on that Windows 10 virtual machine again. So if you go here to UAC, I'm just going to type on UAC there. You can see it says user account control. There we go. Give it a moment. There we go. Now, something interesting about this menu that we see in front of us is from Vista all the way to where we are today with Windows 11. Now, I'm using Windows 10 right now, but up until Windows 11, this thing looks identical. The only difference is on Vista, at the bottom below this little bar, there was a tick box. Now, I don't remember what the tick box said, but I remember what it did. If you went and ticked it or unticked it, the whole screen in the background would at least not go dark or black. That's basically what it's what the purpose it served. But other than that, that's everything is exactly the same. From Windows 7, the tick box got removed, and this is exactly what it looks like from 7 all the way to Windows 11. Now, on Vista, we used to drag this all the way to the bottom, which would basically turn off UAC, and on Windows 7, we, used, we just left it on on the default, which is what I'm doing right now. So that is pretty much where you go and do it, and yeah. Anyway, going back to the information. All right, so we spoke of least 
privilege earlier, and this is kind of sort of what this UAC platform is about. It requires consent, even if the user is an administrator. If you are an administrator, it'll just ask you, are you sure? And you just have to say yes or no. If you're not an administrator, it's going to ask for a password and username of said administrator. And if you go and allow something or block something, this is just you go and do a temporary. So it's going to allow something temporary or it's going to go and block something temporary. Um, where it also might actually ask you for this back then, and I think it might still do it till this day, is we try and run something as an administrator because that is something system-wise. Nowadays, it doesn't really pop up for everything. It'll just pop up for something serious. If you're about to go do some sort of system change or something very, very serious in your computer, then it might ask you. Like trying to run something as an administrator. Why are you trying to do that? That is something odd and peculiar. It might be a system risk, which is why it might actually pop up and ask you to confirm. All right, folks, next up, we've got the topic of authentication, which I find kind of funny since we did talk about, you know, the triple A earlier, authentication, authorization, accounting. But nonetheless, it is a topic, so I shall cover it with you guys. So in authentication, we've got the subtopic of MFA. In other words, multi-factor authentication. So we know what authentication is. That's to prove you are who you claim to be or what you claim to be if this is something like a server. This can be done in more than one way, guys. That brings us to MFA. So multi-factor authentication is to prove you are who you claim to be in more than one way. You get categories. There's three main ones you need to know. These three that I'm going to list for you guys in a moment are the three most commonly known ones and the most widely used ones. But I want to make it clear that these three I'm about to list is not the only ones. They're simply the main ones and the most commonly used ones. So for something to classify as MFA, it has to fall into two different categories or more. Those categories are as follow. The first category is something you know. The second is something you have. And the third is something you are. Something you know would be something like a password, a pin, a phrase. I think you get the idea. Something you have is something you've got physically on your person. This can be something like a bank card, smart card, thumb. Heck, guys, this can even be your cell phone because the cell phone might receive an OTP. It might be an app that you've got to go into in there to acknowledge something. And at the end of the day, the phone is still something you've got physically on you. But the third one, something you are, is normally biometric in nature. Something like a fingerprint, facial recognition, voice recognition, that kind of stuff. And if I just ask you for a pin or a password that is just something you know, it's not multi-factor because it only falls into one category. If I only ask you for a card, it's once again only one item. It only is something that you have. If you look at something like going to an ATM to withdraw money or deposit money, that generally is MFA authentication. Because for the most part, for the average person, it requires something you have and something you know. Uh, it's going to ask you for a PIN number. That is something you know. It's going to ask you for a card, which is something you have. Now, does that stop a criminal? No. Like I said before, nothing will ever stop a criminal. Nothing cannot be hacked. Anything can be hacked, guys. At the end of the day, all you want to do here is discourage bad behavior. So if I stand behind you in a queue at the ATM and I see your PIN number, can I steal your money? No, because I don't have your card. If you forget your card in the ATM, can I steal your money? No, because I don't have your PIN. But what if I saw your PIN number over your shoulder? That does not stop me, theoretically, from following you to wherever you go, clobbering you over the head and just taking your card from your hands. Then I can still rob you. So it's not impossible, guys. It's just to discourage bad behavior because it's now it's a little bit harder for me to go and achieve whatever it is I want to go and achieve. So for something to classify as MFA, it has to be in two different categories. If I ask you for a PIN and a password, yes, that's two authentications, but a PIN is something you know and a part of something you know. They both fall into the category of something you know. So if you look at something like an ATM, yes, something you know, something you have, that indeed is multi-factor authentication, guys. All right, so speaking of authentication, that brings us to our next topic here, guys, Windows login options. In other words, this is just more ways for you to go and prove you are who you claim to be, you already on it to the account or the computer, blah, blah, blah. All right, so there's a bit of a picture there on the right-hand side for you guys. This was taken in the settings app. That's effectively the new control panel on Windows. 
please take pictures like that, that you guys see in the course with a pinch of salt because there's a subject to change. Microsoft is constantly changing the operating system. Some months they'll change something like five times. Sometimes it'll take months to go and change something. But in the end of the day, the pictures just serve as an idea of more or less the options you will have. But if you were to go into your settings app and you see your options look slightly different, don't panic guys, that's normal. Microsoft does that with their updates. So when it comes to login options, we've got your normal traditional username and password. That is something we've always had. We know what that is. You've got your PIN. Yes, you can actually in fact now go and add a PIN to your computer. So when you start your computer by pressing the power button, besides asking you the conventional username and password, it will actually also ask you for a PIN. You can also go and add a picture password. This allows you to go and choose any picture on your machine that's built in or that you've downloaded or whatever. This can be a picture of your cat's face for crying out loud. And on that picture, you have to do invisible gestures. So this is normally about two or three gestures. So the first gesture might be to draw a circle around the cat's nose. The second one will be to go and draw a straight line from the nose to the left ear. You get to choose what the gestures are. You can do anything. Now once you've done that, it's going to ask you to confirm your gestures. Just like when you choose a password, it's going to ask you to confirm that new password. So once again, I'm going to circle the nose, draw a straight line from the nose to the left ear, or whatever gestures you choose, and there you go. The next time you start a computer, you'll be presented a picture of, well, whatever, in my case it's a cat's face, and you will need to do those invisible gestures, which, well, only you know. And then lastly, guys, we have something called Winners Hello. It's been around since the beginning of Windows 10, since Windows 10 was released, but hardly anyone knew what it was and hardly anyone actually used it. Now we're sitting at a point in time where so many companies are using it or looking to start using it, and it really, really is something great. It can go and use a form of biometrics, and at the end of the day, if you combine this with something like domain authentication, it really is worthwhile. I definitely encourage you guys to go and look into it. All right, so still kind of sort of on the topic of authentication. Here we've got the topic of Windows domains and Active Directory. So normally if you go and install an operating system, like a Windows client operating system onto a computer, that machine is on what we call a work group. That's a default scenario. And if you would like to log on to that machine, you press the start, but start button, you click on an account, it's normally just like one, and you type in the password if there is one and local authentication would occur. That means that machine is going to check locally on that device and that device alone if you are indeed the owner to that account. It's going to do that to check, it's going to basically check if your password matches that account. It checks in something called the SAM locally, not something you need to know. SAM. It's basically a tiny little database on that computer which basically houses all the user accounts and all that. And let's face it, it's probably going to be only like one in there if it's a local account. Then we have what we call Active Directory Accounts, also known as Domain Accounts. That is when you have gone to a company and you've joined that computer, that laptop, that desktop, to the company Domain. So if I had a company, it'll probably be called Burning Eyes Tech or BurningEyesTech.com, you know, if I have to thumb suck something here. And my domain would obviously be the same. It'll be BurningEyesTech.com. And if, if I had company computers, they would probably be joined to that domain. And if someone wants to sign in in the morning when they come to work, they would have to grab a PC, type in the username. You don't click on one. You actually have to type it in now. And it's going to go and check on a central point of authentication if that account actually exists and resides. It's going to go check on the middle server, which is the domain controller, where you go and install the Active Directory. So normally a company would have a server. On that server, you would add a role. This role is called ADDS, which stands for Active Directory Domain Services. That role effectively installs the software, which is known as Active Directory. And that software allows you as the administrator to create the user accounts, the groups, the organizational units, the group policies, and all that kinds of stuff that we normally know. So that is where the Active Directory is and what it actually does. So you're going to go and take your computers at the company, domain, a company network. You're going to join them to your domain. And then you can go to any one of your computers in your company that's been joined to the company domain. You can type in one of your usernames and it will log in because they all check on the same central point that account actually exists and if the password is a match. Now, what is a domain controller? A domain controller, well, that, that Active Directory that we just talked about, that is a domain controller. That is your main one. 
where is your root domain controller or your root Active Directory? Now, some companies have multiple branches. Quite frankly, most companies have multiple branches. And if they've got multiple branches, they probably have multiple people working at those branches. It might be hundreds or thousands. And if all those people wanted to log on to their machines in the morning, do we really want all those machines contacting the same server, which is normally the head office, to check if those accounts actually exist? No. Of course, it's going to basically render that network useless. It's just too many people. So instead, what we do is we go and make a clone of sorts of that server that has basically all the user accounts. We make a clone of that server and we put it on premises at those branches. That is called an RODC, a read-only domain controller. The main one is just called a domain controller or a root domain controller. And the ones you leave at the branch offices are often referred to as RODCs, read-only. They are clones of the server head office and all the users at that branch would basically just authenticate on that local server instead, instead of you know, authenticating at the one at head office over the internet. It just makes things smoother and more efficient. Then we've got something called organizational units, better known as OUs for short. If you don't know what this is, it's basically a fancy name for a fancy folder. I've got um, other videos on my channel that explain these in great detail. Um, I think one of the places you'll find that is if you go to my channel and you go look for the playlist called AZ800. Somewhere in there, there's a video that explains organizational units. And I think a better one would be if you look for a playlist called WS011. That's a server course. And if you go into that playlist, look specifically for a video that says organizational units. It's a video that specifically explains just what organizational units is. And in that video, I show you exactly what it looks like, how to get to them, how to create them, how to manage them, the whole shebang, everything. But in a nutshell, guys, organizational units is a fancy name for a fancy folder. So if you have many people in your company or many devices in your company and you want to manage those people or devices, you will have to go and create what we call group policies, which is the next topic here. There's over 3,000 things you can go and configure in group policies. It's not just to turn things off or to block people. This can be to turn things on, turn things off, block things, allow things, configure things, tweak things. Basically, anything on your computer can be configured via group policies. If it's on your own machine, it's not really worth it because you can just go do it via the GUI. It's a lot quicker and a lot easier. But if you have a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand computers or devices or accounts you need to go and configure, why not go onto the server, configure a group policy where you do it once, and you just choose all those people or all those devices and boom, bam, there you go. So instead of working harder, we work smarter. Now, it's not as simple as just choosing all those groups, of all those users or all those devices. You need to throw all those users into a folder, which is called an organizational unit. And then you link that policy, that group policy, to that fancy folder, which is an OU. You can give the folder any name you want. You can call it sales if you want to. So if I want to apply some sort of policy to all the people in the sales department, or at least all the devices in the sales department, you would then go and create a fancy folder with a name. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it sales department if you want to. It's essentially an OU. And then you go and link whatever that policy is to that fancy folder. And that's going to apply to all those users, all those devices. But it does not work if you go and try and link it directly to user accounts or directly to groups. You have to throw those users or those groups or those devices into one of these fancy folders, which is called an OU. Otherwise, it does not work. If you'd like to know more about this kinds of topics, guys, please leave me know in the comment section down below. And then in the comment section, I will tell you exactly which playlist to go and look at and exactly which video to go and look at where I've discussed this and where I've given you uh, little demos and all that. What I've explained just now, that's more than enough of what you need to know for the scores and for the exam. But should you want to know more, ask me in the comment section down below and I will gladly tell you exactly which playlist, exactly which video. Heck, I can even tell you where in the video to go and skip to if need be, if it's possible or if it's needed. Um, and if you've got any other questions of anything that was discussed in this module as well, guys, feel free to ask those questions down below. Or alternatively, if you look in the video description, way at the bottom, there is a Discord server as well. For those of you who know what Discord is, if you have Discord, I've got a Discord server, it's called Free IT Training. Feel free to go and join that. The idea of that server is to help people 
that's struggling in IT of the studies, not just A+. So various CompTIA courses, Microsoft courses, etc., etc. So if you're studying something in IT, feel free to join that group. And you can go and ask your questions there. And the chances are you'll find someone there that will answer your question. Uh, heck, it could even be me answering your question because I'm also in that server. So it might be me. It might not be me. And if someone else asks, answers, uh, asks a question that you know the answer to, then obviously feel free to help that person as well. The idea is it's supposed to be a free IT training community where we help one another. In the, the day, knowledge is free. Right? So at least we want it to be free. Now, guys, if that doesn't deserve a like, then seriously, I don't know. Please give the video a like. I mean, really, I'm going all out here for you guys. All right, so here's the last topic for the third section. Mobile device management, better known as MDM for short. So if you're going to wake me up in the middle of the night and ask me about mobile device management, for that first couple of seconds, I'll be like, what? What? I'm going to be very confused. So normally we call this just MDM. Um, MDM is not something specific per se. You get many kinds of MDMs. But the most widely used one and the most commonly used one is Microsoft Intune. So Microsoft Intune is the most commonly used example of an MDM. So what is Microsoft Intune? It was originally designed to manage phones and tablets. It's not the only thing we use it for, though, guys. So these days we use it for phones, tablets, laptops, desktops. It's to manage people and their devices remotely wherever the heck they might be. I can manage any device anywhere, anytime. Now, saying it like that sounds like hacking. So to prevent this from being hacking, the catch is these devices need to be enrolled. So Intune is used to control devices remotely, and devices have to be enrolled. So that's the catch here. Otherwise, it will be seen as hacking. Now, when I manage these devices remotely, I can see what they are. Is it the phone, tablet, laptop, desktop? I can see the operating system that's installed, the build of the operating system, the version and the addition of the operating system. And believe it or not, this is not limited to Windows, guys. It works with Apple, it works with Linux, it works with Android, it works with, um, what do you call it, iOS, which is Apple, I believe. It works with pretty much all the operating systems. So the users do not need to be running Windows on the devices. They can be running any device with any operating system. You can still manage those devices. The catch is you just need to enroll those devices, obviously. I can see what updates you've got installed, drives you've got installed, applications. I can install or uninstall those things that I see. Heck, I can even go remote wipe your device. And there's many, many, many more things I can go and do, including those compliancy policies we spoke of earlier when we talked about user accounts. All right, folks, finally, I cannot believe I'm saying this because this module is insanely long. That brings us to the end of the third section. Now we're moving on to the last, the fourth section of this module, which is manage Windows shares. I know it sounds mean when I say this, but I'm glad because I'm tired. My mouth feels like a cotton ball from all this talking. So you better be giving this video a like. Otherwise, I'm going to be coming to your house. I'm going to throw a bunch of ants in your bed. I'm just kidding. I won't go and do that. I'll hack you. No, I'm kidding. I won't do that either. Um, yeah, for those of you that's been watching the video up until this point in time, well down. I take my hat off for you guys because I can see you guys are very serious. You're de definitely taking this stuff seriously. And if you want to have a little bit of fun with the guys that did not watch so far, like usual, I've got a secret phrase for you guys to go and type in the comment section down below. You can either ask your questions down below or you can just type a secret phrase down below, which will just confuse the people that don't actually pay attention. Um, the secret phrase for this module today is... I powered all the lights in my house using just bananas. I know, totally random. I sucked it out of my thumb just now on the spot. So if you guys can think of something more creative, feel free to join my Discord server and, well, let me know. Then maybe next time we can put your ridiculous phrase in one of the modules just for the fun of it. I'm completely open to suggestions, guys. If you can think of something ridiculous to put in one of these modules as a phrase, by all means, go to Discord, go and add me on Discord. Let me know what the phrase is, and then maybe we can make a plan. Maybe we can go put it in the next module. So today's one is something silly. It's called, I can power all the lights in my house using just bananas. <laughs> you can be creative about it. You can go and maybe alter it a little bit, the sentence, and, you know, be creative about it, I suppose. All right, so what is the first topic in the last section? That would be work group setup. Now, we already kind of have an idea what work group is because we spoke about it earlier briefly. We mentioned that if you just installed Windows onto a machine, it will generally be on what we call a work group. And then later, you can, if you want to, or if you need to, 
you can go and join that machine to what is known as a domain. This is something we normally only do in a company. And a word of advice here, guys, if you want to do that, your machine has to have the right edition of Windows. Normally, this is only possible if you're running enterprise or professional edition of Windows. Any lower edition will not have the ability to go and join a domain. You have to have enterprise or professional of your respective Windows. So this could be Windows 10 or Windows 11. All right, so what are we going to be talking about right now when we talk about workgroup setup? Well, guys, that will be things like workgroup networking versus domain networking. Now, workgroup is something you would do in your home or a very small office environment. There's no fancy service, there's nothing. So in a workgroup scenario, there's benefits, there's drawbacks, and the same can be said about domains. A workgroup scenario is very easy to set up. That's a benefit. If I want to share something, easy peasy. If I want to find someone on a network and connect to them, easy peasy. Very, very easy. A drawback is you've got little to no security. There's hardly any. If you look at a domain scenario, setting it up is not easy peasy. It can sometimes be time consuming and quite complicated at times. A benefit would be you've got massive security. You can go and configure NTFS permissions and your domain permissions and what have you. So that is a massive benefit right there. Something to keep in mind with both of these types of networks, if you would like to go and share with something in these networks, make sure you've configured something called networking discovery correctly. Generally, we have to go and turn it on. So just because you've connected to the network wirelessly or via cable, and because you've configured the IP address correctly and allowed it for the firewall, blah, 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 that does not automatically mean people can find your machine or that you can find another machine. You need to turn on network discovery. Otherwise, that machine is essentially invisible. You can imagine it like wearing an invisibility cloak, kind of like in Harry Potter. And then we've got file sharing. How do we go about doing that? Now, that's still coming up. So that's going to be our next topic here, guys, which is file sharing configuration. There's a bit of a picture for you guys on the right-hand side. That is if you were to go and do something called simple sharing. You get simple sharing and you get advanced sharing. Now, the last time I checked in the new version of A+, there's no questions about this in the exam. Doesn't mean that there will be none when you go and write. I mean, at the end of the day, the exam is subject to change. CompTIA can change this at the moment's notice. But the last time I checked, there was no questions about folder sharing or file sharing. They will ask you about interface permissions. Yes, that was in the exam. But file sharing, I didn't see anything, but you know, you never know. They might have gone and added. So simple sharing, how does that work? In advanced sharing, how does that work? Let me show you guys. I'm gonna go to that virtual machine of mine. A few moments later. All right, here we are on that virtual machine of mine, folks. I'm gonna go right click here on the desktop. I'm gonna make a random folder for a moment. There we go. Now if that folder contains something that I would like to share on the network of my coworkers or my friends or colleagues or whatever, you right click on it. That's one way to go about it. And if you've got an old version of Windows 10 or anything older than Windows 10, you would normally go here where it says share with. This is called simple sharing, folks. And you would go and choose here specific people. You can go and choose who you want to share with or what groups you want to go and share with. And normally if you go right click here and you go to the properties, there's a tab here that says sharing. There you can also click on share. That's the same as right clicking on it and just clicking on share. That's also simple sharing. So if I click on that, you can see it looks the same. At the bottom, we've got advanced sharing, which is very much the same thing in my opinion. There's not much of a difference. If we go here, we can give it a name now. I mean, you could just change the name there in my opinion. Little comments, and then permission-wise, you've got a little bit more choice, but not really by much. So there's not much of a difference there. Now, something worth noting here, guys, if you are using Windows 11, or if you're using one of the newer versions of Windows 10, if you right-click on a folder, You'll notice here, it does not say share with. I think it says give permission to now or something like that. The name has actually changed. So ever so often, Microsoft will release these huge, big, fat updates, which they call feature updates. This normally happens about every six months. Yes, you get updates all the time, but they're not feature updates. About every six months or so, Microsoft releases huge updates called feature updates. It's essentially a whole new operating system. They add stuff, remove stuff, and change stuff regarding your Windows. It's basically a new Windows operating system. And in one of those big fat updates, they went and removed this button we see in front of us that says share with. It was actually just gone. There was nothing. And for you to go and share something, you had to go and take the long way to the bottom, which is properties, 
and you had to go to the sharing tab and you had to go click there or there, which was very annoying. It didn't last very long. Shortly after that, they actually went and brought back that option, except they did not keep the name. Now it says give permission to or something like that. So it does exactly the same thing. It works exactly the same thing. It looks exactly the same with the exception of the name that has changed. So I suppose they might have changed the name, otherwise they would be admitting fault. They would be admitting that they made a boo-boo. All right, so that's a little bit about file sharing configuration. Next up, we've got network browsing and mapping drives. So how do we go about browsing the network from a normal user device like a laptop or a desktop? From the client's perspective, from the user's perspective. Well, guys, you can see in the picture, the person went to the bottom left, they clicked on network, and if you are indeed on a network, it would show you other devices there with their names. That's assuming, of course, they've got discovery turned on. Very easy peasy, right? It might look slightly different on your machine, depending on whether you're using Windows 10 or 11 and what version and updates you've got, but that's generally the gist of it. You just go to the bottom left, you go to network, it'll show you what devices are on your network. This will be laptops, desktops, printers, servers, all that kinds of stuff. Then we've got mapping drives. So the previous picture was all about network browsing. Now we're talking about mapping drives. Now a mapped drive, for those of you who don't know, looks like an extra hard drive in your computer, except the symbol looks slightly different. So if you go to your computer, which I believe is called this PC, and you go there and you go look at your hard drives, you'll see it looks like a normal hard drive, except you've got like a little pipe icon over the hard drive. That means that hard drive, which looks like a hard drive, is not a hard drive. At least it's not a hard drive on your computer. It is some remote location somewhere else. This can be a hard drive on another computer or another server, or it can be a folder on another computer or another server. Now, if you have, let's say, a file server in your company, this file server has many folders. Each folder has a person's name on it, and the idea is for that person to go and back up into the folder which has got their name on it. Many companies do this. This is called a file server, DFS server in some cases, you know, that's the abbreviation for it. And you'll find normally only that user can go into that folder with the exception of the administrator that can go in anywhere. The idea is for people to go back up on, into those folders. It's not the only idea here, but that's, that's the main idea. Now, in those situations, if you tell the people to go to Cortana or wherever and to go and browse to the server and to browse to their folder, most of them will have no idea what you're talking about. And even if they do know by some slum, small, slim chance what you're talking about, they're definitely not going to want to go through all that effort. It's a lot of effort. Even the IT guys that know how to go and do it will, will not want to go through all that effort. It's a lot of work. So what you can go and do is you can go and map that folder which is the user's folder on that server, as a drive. You go to map drives, you browse to that, that computer or that server, you browse to that folder or that hard drive, you select it and you map it as a drive. So now what's going to happen is it's going to appear as an actual hard drive on the user's computer, and the next time they want to go into that folder, just double-click on that hard drive, and presto, behold, they're in that folder. So this is useful for people that don't know what they're doing, and it's also useful for people that just don't want to go and do all that work, which includes myself. So let me quickly go to the virtual machine and just briefly show you where you find this function. All right, so here we are on the virtual machine. I'm going to go here to File Explorer at the bottom. You can see there's the network icon I spoke of. Unless if you were to go click there, that would allow you to basically view stuff on the network. You can see my network discovery is turned off, so I would essentially be invisible. If you go to your computer here, there I have a hard drive, but if I had a map drive, it'll look like that, but it'll have like a little pipe icon over it. So how do I map a drive? You can either do it via the GUI, or you can do it via command prompt. In command prompt, you would type a net space use space the letter of the drive that you want to go and use, you know, what letter do you want to allocate, and the path. Or if you want to go use the GUI, which is what most of us do, you just go here to the computer, map network drive, you choose a letter, you can only choose letters that has not been taken yet, for, for example, letter C is obviously taken. You can either browse to the network to that, folder that hard drive on that machine or you can just type in the path if you happen to know the name or the path and that's it guys easy peasy done as simple as that all right let's go back to our list 
So I think we've pretty much covered native browsing and mapped drives. So just to summarize, we've covered mapped drives. And then if you would want to know what those commands looks like, I did mention it to you guys earlier. Um, you're going to type in net space use space the letter. I chose the letter X here. Um, you just choose a letter that has not been taken yet. Um, you can see there's a double dot there. Backslash, backslash the name of the server or the computer where this folder or hard drive is. So the word host is not going to be host in your case. You're going to change or substitute the word host with the name of the computer or the server where this hard drive or this folder is. And then from there, you just need to go where it says share. You just need to go look at what the actual breadcrumb is on that specific server. If you need to go and delete that map drive, which I find very unlikely, there is the command to go and delete that drive as well, just in case you guys want to know what it looks like. Right, next up folks, we've got something called printer sharing. Now this is something I see more commonly in a small office home office environment. I suppose you might also see this in a household. It's not something I see often in medium to large size companies because normally in medium to large size companies, they've got those big printers that they share. It might be in a corner of the office or it might be in a separate office somewhere. And if you or the users want to print something, it prints to that big printer, which is fast and, you know, all that stuff and is a lot cheaper. You walk to the printer, you go and collect your documents and you go on of your day. Now, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a scenario. Imagine this is a small office. It's a small business. Let's say, for argument's sake, it consists of only 20 people working in this building. And out of those 20 people, they each have their own computer. But only one or two of them actually have printers. These are not those big fancy printers. They're small printers. It can be a cheap laser printer or a cheap inkjet printer, which is literally on their desk next to the computer. That printer or printers are printed or, or plugged in directly onto the user's computers. I think let's keep it to one person. Let's say only one person has a printer. It's plugged in directly onto that person's laptop or desktop. Now, if all the other 19 people want to print something, how will they go about that? They will either have to go and copy this item that they want to print onto a flash drive, external drive, or they'll have to email it to the person who's got a printer, or they'll have to send it over the network to that person, and they'll basically have to go and beg, you know, for that, this person to print the document. And should they be willing to, and should they have the time to, they will print the document. Now, this is not feasible. This is insane to go and do that way. So what you could go and do in that scenario is the person who has the printer installed on their laptop or desktop, you can go to that device, and you can actually share that printer on the network. Now, from the other 19 computers, you're going to go to the network. You're going to type in the IP address or the name of the computer where the printer is. It's going to look something like what we see in the picture there. It's going to show you all the folders that are shared in that computer, along with the printer that's been shared. And then you just double click on a printer, or you right click and you click on connect. And there you go. Easy peasy. You don't need to install the printer. Nothing. So on the first device, yes, you had to actually go and install the drivers, you had to go and calibrate it and all that kinds of fancy jazz. But on the all 19 computers, you just go and connect to the printer and there you go. So when the other 19 want to print something, the next time they want to print, you just go look in the list of printers. They will see that printer now or whatever you listed it as. They click on it and they can print through your computer to that printer. The downside here is the middleman being your computer where the printer is, has to be on for this to work. But it's a small sacrifice to make, in my opinion. Most of the time it will be on. Now, should you not be at the office and should your PC be at the office, it will not work because your PC is going to be off. All they need to do, though, is you just need to turn your laptop on or turn your desktop on. They don't even need to log on. It just needs to idle on the log on screen and they will still be able to print because the print spooler will be running in the background. Now, when it comes to sharing the printer, guys, I'll show you guys how to go and do it, but please take this with a pinch of salt because it does not look exactly the same for all computers. But what I'm about to do should give you guys a bit of a more or less idea. So let me go into my control panel on my laptop right now. And you guys can see what it looks like. I happen to have a printer on my PC right now. So let me go. All right, folks, here we are on my computer, on my laptop. I'm in control panel. I went to hardware and sound, devices and printers. I happen to have a printer. It's not turned on right now, but there we go. Nonetheless, there's a printer. If you'd like to share your printer, you right click on it. It might be under preferences or might be under properties. I think mine's under properties. The menus here does not look the same for all printers. You can even have the same brand as me, but you'll see your, mo your model is different than me. 
and your menus will be different. So the good news here is these menus are designed in such a manner that they will be user friendly because the idea is people that don't even know IT are supposed to be able to figure these menus out. So you don't even need to be in IT to be able to figure these menus out. Very clearly, there'll be a button or a tab or a drop, or drop down menu labeled as sharing. In my case, it happens to be a tab. I'm gonna go there, share this printer, and you give it a name. Now mine originally had that name there in there, but you can go and type in your name there in a printer, or if this is the printer in the reception, you can go and type in reception printer. I think you guys get the idea. And I'm gonna say apply, and I'm gonna say okay. And then the printer will appear between my shared folders. And if I go and unclick that block, it'll then go and unshare itself. As easy and as simple as that. I'm not really gonna share it, otherwise my kids are gonna end up printing stuff through my PC, the naughty little buggers. All right, let's go back to our list. Okay, so I believe we've pretty much covered printer sharing. Next up, we've got NTFS permissions and inheritance. Unfortunately, folks, this is going to be a topic in the exam. There's only like one or two questions in the exam regarding this, so it's not a very important one. It's a very old topic, but they've kind of decided to keep it. And I suppose that's a good thing because some, the NTFS permissions is something we still have till this day. Now, considering that this is a relatively important topic, I think I'm going to have to draw this one for you guys. So, yeah. Now, if I were to go and make a brand spanking new folder on my computer, this can be in my documents, it can be on my desktop. The very first folder that I'm going to create, I'm going to give it a name. Here we have a folder now. I'm going to give this folder the name of folder one. The name doesn't really matter, but let's keep it to folder one. Let's keep things simple. And then if I were to go and double click on this folder called folder one, inside of this folder, I'm going to create two extra folders. And I will call these two folders folder two and folder three, respectively. And because I have to also explain a concept of inheritance to you guys, uh, I'm going to create one extra folder. So if I were to go and double click on folder two here, I'm going to go and create one extra folder inside of folder two, and that will be called, and you can probably guess the name, folder four. All right, now looking at the very first folder we created, way at the top, what do we call that folder? And I'm not talking about the name we gave it earlier. Your very first folder, your main folder, folks, is called the root. You'll find it the domain of everything in IT we call the root. So your main folder, your main hard drive, your main server, your main whatever is always called the root. So this is called the root. It's not just called the root, though. It's also called the parent or a parent, should I say. Now, the two folders that we have within folder one, which is folder two and folder three, what do we call those? Once again, I'm not referring to the names written on the folders. We call those childs. So folder two and folder three here are both childs. So folder two is a child, folder three is a child. Now at the same time that folder two is a child, it's also a parent because it has a folder inside of it. That child inside of it, well, I actually gave the name away, is called a child. So folder four is also a child. Now, the reason why they've given it these names, I don't know. I've, I suspect it's got to do with inheritance because the inheritance works very much the same as us human beings. We inherit from our parents. And I'm not talking about objects. I'm talking about things like genes. So you would normally inherit your parents' eyes, their nose, their crooked teeth, that kinds of stuff. Now, somewhere along the line, this might be coming from your grandpa or your grandma or something, but you do not inherit from them directly. Your parents inherited from them directly and you inherit directly from your parents there's not such a thing as you inheriting directly from your grandparents once again i'm not talking about objects i'm talking about genes now why i'm really focusing on that is because these folders and their inheritance and permissions work almost identically the same by default in all of these folders we have something called inheritance which is turned on by default it will be on at any point in time, you can go and turn off inheritance on any one of these folders specifically if need be. But we'll do that a little bit later. So if I were to go to the very, very first folder we created, folder one, and I add a permission, this can be any permission. This can be to go and say, allow burning ice. That permission 
will be passed down to folder 2 and folder 3. Why? Because folder 2 and folder 3 are both children of folder 1. So folder 2 is a child of folder 1, folder 3 is a child of folder 1, so therefore they inherit from folder 1 by default. So anything you add, remove, or change, or whatever in folder 1, folder 2 and folder 3 will by default inherit that. Now folder 4, way at the bottom, which is an inside folder 2, it does not inherit from folder 1. However, who is the parent to folder 4 here? That would be folder 2. And since folder 2 just inherited something from folder 1, its parent, folder 4 is going to see, oh, hang on a moment. My parent, my mommy or my daddy just inherited something or something just changed on my parent. Let me grab that too. Let me inherit that too. Doesn't matter what the permission is. Now, as I've said earlier, at any point in time, you can go and disable inheritance. So I'm going to go and do this smack back in the middle. Let's do that on folder two here, right in the middle. Now, if you were to go and disable inheritance on a folder, like folder 2, it does not discard any permissions that it has inherited thus far. So anything that I've added, it's going to keep that. It's just from this point forward, it will no longer inherit anything from its parent. Now, that doesn't mean you can't change the permissions. At any point, you can still go in there and you can go manually add or remove something. Or another technician that has got permission can go in there, add and remove something as needed, of course. And at any point in time, you can also go and obviously turn inheritance back on if really needed. So if I were to go back to folder one now and symbolize some sort of change, if I add or remove or change something, the child of folder one that's still got inheritance turned on, they will inherit that. So folder three will inherit that change. Folder two will not. And if folder two does not inherit that change, what's going to happen to folder four? Folder 4 will also not inherit that change because Folder 4, even though it's still got inheritance turned on, who is Folder 4's parent? That, folks, is Folder 2. And since nothing has changed here on Folder 2, therefore nothing will change on Folder 4. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to go and do this practically. I just showed you guys a bit of a drawing here, mumbo jumbo and all that kind of stuff. We are going to go and do this practically on that virtual machine that I've been using all along. So let's switch over to that virtual machine and quickly go and have a bit of a, a bit of a demo so you guys can see this in real life. All right, folks, back on the virtual machine we are, like usual. So I think for this exercise, let's use this folder on the desktop that we created already earlier. I can't even remember why we did that. Um, I'll have to go back in time to go and check why we made this folder. Anyway, so what was our first folder called besides being root and parent? I think we called it folder one. Not that it matters, but let's try and replicate what I just explained to you guys. I'm going to call this folder one. There we go. Inside folder two, um, help me remember here. Oh, wait, I can't hear you guys. I really need to start doing live training sessions. I think that will probably be a lot of fun. Um, let me know in the comment section down below, and by the way, um, if you guys would like me to do live training sessions and how you would feel about that. And at that point in time, you know, we can obviously have like a comment section. You guys can ask me questions live during the training session. Um, I think for something like that, if I were to consider it, I would probably schedule it like days or a week at least in advance because, I mean, obviously you guys are working. This is not just like a five or ten minute stream. It's going to be at least an hour long for some of these modules. So you're going to have to put like an hour aside. You would need to know when it's going to happen. So we want to try and arrange it um, in the time which suits most people best. I'm going to have to go and check where most of my audience is. I think the majority of my audience is kind of like in a time zone of America, Europe and America. But unfortunately, Europe and America, you know, they, they differ like by between four and six hours. So I would try, try and do it in a time slot when I know that the majority of those guys, uh, let's say, are on a weekend. I would say, yeah, let's do this on a Saturday, maybe. If I were to do this, I'll probably do it on a Saturday, and I know the majority of the guys would not be working. I don't want to do it in a week when guys are working because they can't watch my videos in office hours. Maybe some of you guys can, but most cannot. So the idea would be, if I was going to do a live session, to have the guys ask me questions in the live session about what's being trained. And I don't know, we'll take it from there. So maybe I'll do this as an experiment once upon a time with some small random course. And we'll see how that goes. And if it goes well, then maybe I'll do it again. We'll see. So for now, just let me know in the comment section. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think about that. 
So here we got, we've got folder one. I'm gonna go and create folder two and three. Folder two. And folder three. And then we obviously had folder four inside folder two. There we go, folks. So at the moment, everything is on default, default settings. That would mean inheritance is currently turned on. So we're gonna right click on folder one here. Properties, and no, we're not dealing with sharing permissions. Oh, that's why we made that folder earlier. Was was, was was sharing? Forgot about it. I couldn't remember why we made that folder. So that was sharing. There is security. Security is NTFS. So there you can go click on edit. You can go and add or remove or change basic stuff regarding NTFS. That will be advanced. We're gonna do both. We're gonna need to do both, unfortunately, for this topic. So I'm gonna start off something basic like edit. I'm gonna go and add or remove or change something. It doesn't really matter. The idea here is to symbolize some sort of change. It doesn't really matter what the change is at this point in time, so I'm just going to go and add a built-in group. It really doesn't matter. This is just to show you guys that it does inherit some sort of change. So I'm going to go and add something. It doesn't really matter what permissions I give. This is just a demo in the day. Apply. There we go. So we just added something. A group called everyone, and I gave it full permissions. Not that it matters. So that is the change I just did. Where did we do that? We did it on folder one and only folder one. I click on OK. OK. Now, let's go deeper. I'm going to go to folder two. I have not changed anything on folder two or three myself, but we do expect to see the same built in group added there because inheritance is in fact turned on by default, like I said earlier. So if we were to go right click on folder two, properties, security, there it is. I didn't add it. It added itself because folder two is a child of folder one and folder two inherits directly from folder one. If we were to go check folder three, we expect to see the exact same can of worms here. Same thing. And if we were to go check folder four, folder four, we also expect to see the same thing, but not because it's inherited directly from folder one. The reason, the reason why folder four, we expect to see the same thing is because folder two inherited from folder one. And folder 4 inherits from folder 2, and it sees something has changed on its reparent, therefore it will inherit that too. If I right click here and I go to properties, security, there we go. It also inherited that change. So just like my drawing earlier, I'm going to go smack that in the middle to folder 2. We are going to go and disable inheritance now, folks. We're going to go to properties, security. This time around, we're going to go click on advanced. And here you can go and do pretty much the same deal except a little bit more, there is a button that says Disable Inheritance. If you were to click on that, it's going to go and convert these permissions to explicit permissions. It's going to disable inheritance. You're going to notice the title of that button will change to Enable Inheritance. You're actually going to use the exact same button to turn us back on if you want to go and do that. Do that. I'm going to go click on that. Convert to Explicit. Yes, please. And there you go. You can see the title has just changed to Enable. So we're going to use the same button to turn it back on. We're not going to do that now. Apply. Okay. You can see it did not discard any permissions. It still has that permission. It's just from this point forward, it will no longer inherit anything. You're going to have to go and add or remove stuff manually unless you go and turn inheritance back on. I'm going to click on OK. We're going to go back to folder one. We're going to symbolize another sort of change here just to show you guys that it does no longer inherit anything. Properties, security, doesn't matter what I add, remove, or change here. It's just to show you guys the change. So I think for the purpose of this demonstration, let's just keep it simple. I'm literally going to go and do it in reverse. I'm going to go remove that group I added earlier. There we go. So that's what it's going to look like. And now all the childs that has, still has inheritance turned on, um, like folder 3, would probably inherit that. Folder 2, we do not expect to see any inheritance taking place. So I'm going to go to folder 2 first. Folder 2 has inheritance turned off, so we expect no change to take place. It still needs to have that all permission. Let's go check it out. You can see it still has that. It did not discard that. Nothing has changed because inheritance is turned off. Now on folder 3, on the other hand, it still has the default setting, which is to have inheritance turned on. Here we expect folder 3 to inherit the change which was just taken place on folder 1. So we check it out. Yep, group is missing. Now we go to folder four. 
We did not turn anything off on all the Folder 4. It's still turned on. But where does it get its inheritance from? Only Folder 2. Not its Folder 1, which is its grandparent, if you want to make that up. It gets from Folder 2. Nothing changed on Folder 2. Therefore, nothing changes on Folder 4. So we go and check it out. And see, nothing changed on Folder 4. Exactly like we expected. So that, folks, is NTFS permissions and inheritance in a nutshell. The only other thing you guys need to remember here is a deny permission will always overrule allow permissions. So if you are in a group that says allow and there is a the direct permission that says deny, you are denied. If you are in a group that says deny and you, there's a direct permission that says allow, you are still denied. It doesn't matter how many times you're allowed. If there is one permission somewhere along the line that says deny, even if it's indirectly, you will be denied. Deny always overrules allow, folks. All right, so let me close this. Let's go back to our list of topics. We're almost done, folks. All right, so we've pretty much covered that topic. Moving on to the next one, domain setup. So we are covering this from the client perspective. In other words, the user perspective. So if you find yourself on a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 machine and you want to join that to the company domain for argument's sake there are certain ways you're going to go about that the easiest way would probably be go to system properties there you can go and well join your domain now there is some notes about that you need to have certain network requirements you need to be on the company network either via cable or wi-fi um, at the very least you need to be on the company vpn otherwise it's not going to work once you find yourself in the company network make sure the file is not blocking you make sure you've got the right ip configurations all that jazz then you can try and join a company domain by typing its name in and you will be prompted to type in an administrator username and password. Now this is not a local administrator account. This is an admin account on the domain that you are about to join. Now unless you are an administrator on that company domain, good luck. It's not going to work. You're going to have to contact an administrator in that domain and he or she will have to come to your machine provide their credentials so you can join this machine through domain. And if this happens to be a device that is not part of the company, you know, it doesn't belong to the company, they're going to have a lot of questions. They probably might even block you. So yes, you are going to need administrator approval. Lastly, once you've joined the domain, you're going to find this machine is going to want to restart. And once you restart, you're going to have to sign into the domain pretty much immediately with a domain account. And from there, it's just business as usual, folks. So how or where do we join the domain? I can briefly show you guys in the virtual machine, but please take this with a pinch of salt. It does change from version to version of Windows because every time they release an update, it looks different. Let's quickly show you guys. So here we are on that same virtual machine. I'm going to go to Explorer and uh, I'm going to right click on this PC, Properties. And mine currently looks like this. If you've got a relatively old build of Windows 10, or a previous version of Windows older than Windows 10, you know, like Windows 8 or Windows 7, it's going to look like this. You can go here to change settings. Yours is by default going to say workgroup here, where mine says domain, and your default workgroup will also say workgroup. You got to change settings, and you're going to go and join a domain here. You guys say you can use other all of these, so you can just go and say here I want to use the wizard, or just click on change. I just prefer to click on change. Yours will be on a workgroup by default, like I said. The default workgroup is called workgroup. You click on domain, you type in the domain you're about to go and join, you click on OK, and it's going to pop up with a prompt asking you for the administrator to use the password. So that's one way. Now the new menu for this is more the settings app view, and way on the right you're going to have to click on um, system properties, but it's like multiple tabs on the right here. You'll find it's like four or five, and they all essentially take you to the same menu. All of them will take you to this window just on different tabs, and then you just click on the computer name tab, and you just click on change, and that will do the same thing. Alternatively, you can go to the settings app, settings. So for those of you who don't know, the settings app is the new control panel. The old one is going to be removed. You go to about, so you're going to have to go to system and then about. And then here you would normally be, go be able to join. Now this looks different on every freaking machine. Some machines will have two big gray buttons that says join domain, join cloud domain, or Azure domain. Some will have like a hyperlink that says join domain. If you click on it, it's going to open a little wizard. Other ones will look different. So it depends on what edition or what build you've got, how up to date it is, and also depends on other variables. You know, do you have an evaluation or using a trial? In my case, I think I'm using an evaluation that I downloaded from Windows. So mine's not going to allow me to go and do that nonsense at this time. All right, folks, moving back to our list of topics. 
Next up, and believe it or not, this is the last topic in the last section for this module, roaming profiles and folder redirection. So let's start off with roaming profiles. So this is for people that use more than one device and they would like to see their account on these different devices. So if you're gonna go and use your desktop at the office and then suddenly after a week, you quickly grab your laptop and you wanna go and see a client, now you log on to your company domain account on that laptop, but you don't necessarily see the same settings, configurations, and blah, blah, blah. So the idea here is when you go and use the roaming profile, the profile is copied to the workstation as soon as you log in. And as soon as you log off, it's copied back. So it's gonna go and synchronize in other words. So you log into that laptop, even if you haven't been there in ages, it's gonna go and copy it from the server to that laptop or whatever machine you're logging into, and then eventually later that day when you log off, it's gonna go and copy it back to the machine. Now what they don't tell you here is this could potentially take a while to go and copy all of this stuff. Sometimes it takes a while because your internet's slow, it's unstable, or you just quite frankly have a lot of stuff that needs to be copied. Then we also have something called folder redirection. So this is not the actual profile itself of the settings. This folks is the data. Personal folders are redirected to the file share, so it's still gonna have a server involved here where your stuff is stored. This time it's not the actual account in the settings, it is your data. So once again, I'm gonna use the same example. Imagine you use a desktop PC every day at the office. It's got certain files and folders and stuff in your documents, pictures, videos, and blah, blah, blah. And one day you decide to go and grab your laptop, go to a client, you go to your documents, and oopsie daisy, you don't have the files you're looking for. Now, if you were to go and configure folder redirection, that's gonna be a different story. It would essentially go and replicate your files and folders to your other domain joint machines. Now, before you go into a panic here saying, hey, but what if someone gets my login details? Can they go to any company domain joint machine, log in as if they are me and then see my files? Uh, no, they cannot. You have to actually go onto the server, kind of what you guys see there in the picture. You've got to go into the server and you've got to specify between which domain machines folder redirection will take place. That does not stop you from logging into other machines. You can still log on to any domain machine or domain joint machine of your account. You just won't see your details. But if you were to log into one of the machines you've specified, which is usually just like two or three for most people, then folder redirection will take place, folks. All right, guys, this has been a very long module. You would remember, for those of you that's watched the previous A plus course, there was also like one very long module which had a lot of networking in it. And I suspect this is the same case. So unfortunately, there is gonna be one or two very long modules. That is A plus for you. I've got no control over that. If you guys have learned something, which I hope you have, please give the video a like. If you'd like to know when module 15 comes out, it's gonna be a very short module, module 15. From there, it'll get a little bit longer again, but 15 will be very short and sweet, guys. So if you'd like to know when the remaining six modules for this course comes out, as well as the practice questions at the end of this course, remember to subscribe. So guys, before you disappear, a special thank you and shout out to all the sponsors of this channel. There's quite a few of you guys, a whole lot of Patreon sponsors, a whole lot of you guys that's been sponsoring me on PayPal. Uh, also, a shout out to those of you that's been clicking on the thanks button below the video. And even those of you that's just been buying me a coffee or a milkshake. So special thanks to all of you guys. I appreciate it. You really do help me a lot. You help me to make more of this kinds of content. And if any of you guys would like to sponsor me, for those of you that's never done it yet, you are welcome to do that. You can find that information in the video description down below. And it should be like way at the bottom somewhere. All right, folks. See you in module 15 of this course.